Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this week, the House passed the Pandemic is Over Act, uh, terminating the national COVID-19 state of emergency. Now, uh, of course, the pandemic is over. It has been over for some time. Americans are well aware of this. Uh, it seems only the government uh, has not been aware of it uh, at the national level and in certain states uh, in this country. So we passed this bill, the House of Representatives did, uh, ending the state of emergency, ending the national emergency, and the president responded in a very interesting way. He agreed with us. He said, yes, the emergency is over on May 11th, which is a very interesting concept, emergency that you can schedule to end in advance. This is a page out of Gavin Newsom's book in California where the state of emergency there had continued month after month, year after year, and as the absurdities piled up, as California last year hosted the Super Bowl during a state of emergency, and as, by the way, the governor uh, refused to abide uh, personally by the dictates issued pursuant to that emergency, eventually he was forced to say, okay, I will end it, but he, and he decided to end it six months uh, in advance. And so the state of emergency in California will now be elapsing on February 28th for those keeping score at home, and the national emergency will be elapsing on May 11th. This is inherently uh, against the very uh, concept of an emergency, to say that we can schedule it to end at a specific date in the future. And it's also against the very concept of an emergency to say that it can last for three years. We have in this country for now almost three years experienced our form of government being turned on its head. As at the national level and in particular in certain states, our entire separation of powers, checks and balances and representative government collapsed under a one man rule. And now that we have moved on from most of that, although there are still some uh, remnants of the controls that were put in place uh, still in effect, we're in a position to assess what was the outcome of all of this. Because yes, there was some uniformity in terms of federal policy, but there was a great degree of difference in terms of how different states responded. Now in my state of California, we had the highest level of government coercion and control throughout the entire COVID-19 experience. We had the most onerous business shutdowns, the longest school shutdowns, the worst church shutdowns. We had the most onerous mass mandates and vaccine mandates and vaccine passports. Each and every step of the way, California had the highest level of government coercion and control, generally done via executive orders without the say of the people, without the say uh, of the legislature, without meaningful judicial review, with 40 million people of our state expected to simply comply. That was the California experience, that was the experience uh, to, to a lesser extent of many other states. But then you had states like Florida that decided that citizens could be trusted to make decisions for themselves, that empowered local communities to govern themselves, that focused on disease control rather than population control. And so we can now look, having now been through this for a few years and have had very different approaches, what was the result of this difference in policy? Well, economically speaking, California had basically the highest unemployment rate in the entire country throughout the COVID-19 state of emergency, whereas Florida had uh, just about the lowest unemployment rate in the country throughout the state of emergency. California has experienced student learning loss unlike anything that has ever been seen before in this country. Uh, there's been a 6% decline in third graders reading at grade level over the last few years, a 7% decline for fourth graders in meeting ELA standards, whereas Florida achieved the highest national assessment of educational progress rankings in their history across math and reading for fourth and eighth graders in 2022. In California, to take another example, in LA, our students lost an equivalent of six months of math in terms of their overall education in that period of time. And we are gonna be grappling with the consequences of this, consequences of this for a long, long time. So California experienced an economic and educational calamity that states like Florida did not experience. And what did we get in return? Because we were all told this was done for the purpose of safety. It was done in order to save lives. 
Well, we can now assess that claim, and when you look at the actual numbers, there was no difference. Age-adjusted COVID mortality rates between California and Florida were awash. It was the same. Despite the uh, unbelievable toll uh, that the lockdowns and related policies took uh, on the people of California. You can also make comparisons uh, within our state. I represent uh, a number of counties that did everything possible to take the approach that Florida did despite what we were dealing with at the state level. So in Placer County, for example, we were the first county in the state to end the local state of emergency. We had our kids back in school earlier than anywhere else in California. We were among the first to end mass mandates and to challenge vaccine mandates. And we did everything possible to enable our businesses to remain open. All the while, we took the steps that were necessary to give vulnerable individuals the tools that they needed to protect themselves. Now, all the while, those of us who favored trusting citizens, who favored freedom, were attacked viciously by the likes of the governor of California, who personally attacked me by name and said that I believed it would have been better to let Californians die. Well, again, you can look at the results in Placer County as compared to other parts of California. Our students did much better. Our employment rate was roughly half the state average. And our public health outcomes were much better with a COVID mortality rate about two-thirds that of the rest of the state. So the evidence now is very clear as to what approach worked and what approach didn't. That those states that tried it as much as possible to maintain the structure of our constitutional form of government did a lot better than those states that decided an emergency could be used to effectuate a indeterminate uh, one-man rule. But there are some who are now saying, uh, as a recent uh, headline in the Atlantic Mag Magazine put it, that we should simply declare a pandemic amnesty at this point, that we should move on, we should forget about all of the damage that was done to our kids who may never get the education uh, learning loss, may ever, never make up for the learning loss that they experienced. We could, should forget the damages that was done to businesses that in many cases have been permanently lost, tens of thousands, 200,000 uh, businesses uh, throughout the country uh, that were shuttered. Uh, we should simply move on and, and forget about it and forgive and forget. And look, I'm all for letting bygones be bygones. And I am willing to work with anyone who is interested in creating good policy going forward. But we do need to pause and consider how it is that this happened in our country. How did we get to a point where the appearance of a virus could cause our entire form of government to collapse. Our founders were not unfamiliar with emergencies. After all, they had just been through a war of independence, and yet they still believed that combining the executive, legislative, and judicial powers in a single set of hands, as James Madison put it, was the very definition of tyranny. So how, well over two centuries now after the founding, did we get to a point where our institutions were so susceptible to collapse? And I think that is a question that merits serious scrutiny, because it could point us in the direction of getting back to some of the founding principles that we've lost touch with. The fact is that we have seen governmental power become more and more centralized and consolidated uh, in recent decades in this country. And it became simply all too easy to fast forward that process to its logical endpoint of one man rule. We have seen our political institutions become less and less representative, less and less self-governing institutions, and it became all too easy to make them not representative at all. Or we've seen more and more of our levers of power in government controlled by special interest groups, especially in California, my state, and so it became all too easy to let special interests completely run the show as they did when it came to the school shutdowns. So, I don't believe that we can simply move on and turn the page and forget about what happened in this country for the last few years. I think we need to give serious thought as to what led us to this point because that, and how we can uh, move ahead and actually now get the pendulum swinging in the other direction. And that's a far more in-depth conversation than my time today will permit. But I would simply like to offer a few ideas. 
And the first is that we need to definitively end the emergency, not on May 11th, but now, not in California on February 28th, but now, and any other states that are retaining the altered legal forms that were put in place through the emergency. And along with that, we need to end all remaining mandates that exist. We took a major step in that direction yesterday in this House uh, by passing legislation to end President Biden's vaccine mandate for health care workers. We also need to look at reforming our emergency laws to make it so you cannot so easily declare an emergency that lasts for years and uh, is allowed to continue uh, indefinitely without any serious review of whether the conditions of emergency uh, continue to exist. In a broader sense, I think that this is a moment where we as a country need to look at the consolidation and centralization of political power in this country. Yes, at the state level, but largely at the federal level, and especially in bureaucracies that operate outside uh, any sort of accountability uh, on the part of, the, of voters. We simply have uh, in, seen this happen over the course of decades in this country, and it's veered us farther and farther from the idea of self-government that was the great American institution, uh, innovation, uh, the institution of self-government. Now, I am seeing encouraging signs in many ways that this is beginning to happen. For example, I'm starting to see at the school board level, parents are getting involved like never before. Parents are running for school board and changing the way that local school districts operate and trying to fight against mandates from the state level that tell them how they should run their schools. The beauty of this is that it gives parents a direct access point in terms of how their local schools are run. That's the idea of self-government, and I think that's something to build on going forward. And finally, on the note of education, I do think we need to get much more serious in this country about civic education, which used to be something that was not simply some addendum uh, to one of your classes, but was part and parcel of your entire education, what it was about, to prepare you for active citizenship, to be well-grounded in what has made America such a unique country in our nation's history, the greatest country in, our, in, our, in, this, in the world's history. Um, what the Constitution is about, why we have institutions like freedom of speech, why the separation of powers and checks and balances are important. I think if we start to teach these things more meaningfully in our schools, then it will reinforce our civic institutions. It will leave them less vulnerable uh, to the sort of transformation that they were put through over the course of the last few years. And should we ever face another pandemic or whatever other threat uh, that may come our way, I think we'll be much better prepared to get through it in the way that Florida did, in the way that Placer County did, uh, and not, unfortunately, in the way that California uh, and many other parts of this country had to suffer through uh, with such a high cost to so many people. Thank you, and I yield. Adam, the time's come to an end. Who do I need to recognize? Mr. Kiley, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Dunn, I want to uh, thank you uh, again uh, after going through the unthinkable, every parent's worst nightmare for your courage to speak out and do everything you can to stop other families from having to go through the same thing. The reality is that far too many families in this country have found themselves in the same unthinkable position. I've worked with a number of them uh, in my own district. Uh, one of whom is the Didier family. Laura and Chris Didier lost their son, Zach, uh, two days after Christmas in 2020. He was a 17-year-old senior at Whitney High School, an Eagle Scout, soccer player, star of the high school musical, no history of drug use. I've had the chance to get to know uh, Laura and her husband, Chris, Zach's parents, uh, over the course of the last couple years as they, like you, uh, have worked to raise awareness about the dangers of fentanyl. Uh, and as part of her work, uh, Laura is actually uh, here in Washington, D.C. today uh, meeting with lawmakers and is now here with us uh, in the room. Laura, I don't know if you want to just briefly stand up so everyone can see your, uh, your button there. This is Zach here. Laura will also be my guest uh, next week at the State of the Union. Thank you for everything that you're doing. And thank you, Mr. Dunn, again as well. There is bipartisan support in this country among Americans for securing the border. 
And there should be bipartisan support in this committee and in this Congress for supporting the border. But I've been rather discouraged by what I've heard at today's hearing. Now, there have been some thoughtful comments on both sides of the dais, but frankly, on one side of the dais, there has been a lot of excuses. We've heard that there may be other sources of the fentanyl in this country. Does that mean we should ignore the overwhelming nexus with the vulnerabilities at our border? We've heard that what we really need is comprehensive immigration reform. That is a question separate and apart from securing the border, which is about enforcing the laws that we already have. We've heard that immigration, illegal immigration, has been a problem for the last 50 years. Well, the two biggest years in terms of number of illegal border crossing by far have been the last two years. 2022 fiscal year, 2021 fiscal year. The month with the highest number of illegal border crossings is not some random month in the last 50 years in the 1970s or the 1980s. It was last month. December of 2022. The problem keeps getting worse, and what strikes me is the lack of compassion from this administration and those making excuses for it. Compassion for the communities and families being ravaged by fentanyl. Compassion for those who are victims of the horror of human trafficking. And compassion for the migrants themselves, who are now dying in record numbers. During fiscal year 2022, a record number, 856, died attempting to cross the southwest border. That is three times as many as just in 2020. Another facet of this problem is the issue of sanctuary jurisdictions, which we are seeing uh, increasingly across the country, where jurisdictions actively interfere with federal immigration enforcement. My own state of California in 2017, the supermajority legislature and governor declared California a sanctuary state, forbidding local law enforcement from communicating with ICE regarding the whereabouts of wanted criminals. These are folks who uh, are not just immigrants, not just undocumented immigrants, but who have committed crimes while they are here. And from the very beginning, it was predicted that this would raise serious problems. The State Sheriff's Association wrote before this was adopted, our overarching concern remains that limiting local law enforcement's ability to communicate and cooperate with federal law enforcement officers endangers public safety. They said it would preclude staff in our jails from notifying ICE at the request of the pending release of certain wanted undocumented criminals. And we saw, we have seen time and time again, this prediction bear itself out in tragic ways. Just last year in California, there was one of the most horrific crimes I've ever seen. You had a man who murdered his own three, or his own three daughters and their chaperone at a church just a few miles from the state capitol. It turns out this individual was in the country illegally and had been in police custody just the week before because he had assaulted a police officer. And ICE had asked to be notified of his release but the sheriff's office said we can't tell you because of the sanctuary state law. So, uh, Sheriff Daniels, I just wanted to give you uh, a moment uh, if you had any thoughts on the ways that sanctuary policies are contributing to these problems. Well, Congressman, thank for your comments and thank you because that's something sheriffs around the country are talking about. This is where that partnership with our federal uh, uh, partners, state and local have to work together. That collective recipe of success, as I stated in my open statement, is true to how we protect our communities. Thank you for saying that. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Sheriff. I are here waiting to be, oh, oh Miss Hayes too. Okay. Uh, Happy to share the gold star. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're recognized. Uh, Governor Polis, thanks uh, very much for being here uh, today. Um, I believe you're the founder of a charter school yourself, is that right? That's correct, two. Two, two charter schools, and you've been uh, a strong supporter of charters uh, in Colorado. Uh, as you know, uh, after President Biden took office, the administration almost immediately set out to target charter schools uh, with proposed rules that, as you put it, would, quote, gut the federal charter schools uh, program. And you wrote a letter to Secretary uh, Cardona in which you said you strongly oppose the Department of Education's proposed new rules. Now, I have to say, when you were asked about this earlier, you seemed to hedge a little bit 
uh, saying that, well, different states have different authorizing laws. Uh, but there was no hedging in this letter. Uh, you uh, celebrated the national impact of charter schools. You wrote, around the country, public charter schools are making a difference in students' lives. During the 2020-2021 school year, nearly 240,000 new students enrolled in charter schools across the country. You also wrote in this letter, it is confounding and deeply disturbing that the Department of Education would even want to consider making the opening of high quality charter schools considerably more difficult than ever before. Our students need more public school options and high quality charter schools play a critical role in providing that access. So I don't want to put you in a tough spot. I'm coming at this from someone who is very interested in bipartisan education reform. I'm a former high school teacher myself, very interested in working on a bipartisan basis to expand educational opportunity, to expand high quality public school options, to close achievement gaps. Uh, and I have found some uh, partners on the other side of the aisle. I hope to have the chance to collaborate with you as well. Uh, but I have to say, it's been few and far between. With many in your party, it's like running into a brick wall. The only interest they have in charters is how to uh, harass them, uh, how to target them, how to get rid of them. Uh, in my state, California, the governor and supermajority have been condemned time and time again by civil rights groups for their rel relentless attacks on charter schools. So you're the chosen witness here of the minority at today's hearing. I just wanted to get your help in understanding. Why do you think so many elected officials in your party are hostile to charter schools? Well, I don't think that, uh, I don't see charter schools as a partisan issue. In our state, about 15.2% of kids who go to public school go to attend a public charter school. I founded a charter school for new immigrants uh, and English language learners and one for kids who were uh, experiencing insecurity in housing. Um, and again, I, I was uh, pleased that the final rule, again, while I didn't think the rule was necessary for the Department of Education, it did incorporate uh, many of the changes that I suggested, that others suggested, uh, involved with charter schools. This is around a funding stream that specifically supports new charter schools, and it's very important. I uh, helped write some of the legislation when I was here around that piece of the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, and it's really important to support innovation. I think it's a high return investment. It's a small dollar amount, high return. Uh, it's also important to note that not every idea is gonna work out, and, and that's okay. Just as every charter school doesn't work out, every new district initiative doesn't work out, uh, but if you're not trying to do something different, uh, then you're doing things the same I'm way. Sorry, Governor, working, my, time, my, my time is limited, so I just want to get back to the question, sure. because it has become a partisan issue. It was this administration that almost immediately went after charter schools. And as you well know, uh, it's the, the opposition to charter schools uh, largely comes from uh, the other side of the dais. We've heard some comments today, so I want to get your thoughts on this. Why has it become a partisan issue? Because I agree with you, it shouldn't be. Well, again, I... I uh, President uh, Obama was uh, very supportive of uh, high quality charter schools. I have every reason to believe the Biden administration is also supportive of high quality charter schools that improve equity and access. Uh, I think what they're pointing out, and again, I don't always agree with uh, everything that uh, they've said, is they're, even, they're more concerned about the equity and access piece. And I think it is complicated how charter schools affect equity and access. Depends on the particular charter school, depends on, 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 on the attendance, depends on the recruitment. Uh, and yes, some states and some school districts have better or worse authorizing laws than others. We're proud of our authorizing laws in Colorado, and we hope to improve them even more. Do you have any other theories as to why it is that in some states we have overwhelming opposition to charters from one side of the aisle? Uh, well, there's certainly states that have worse uh, charter authorizing laws, and so frankly, they've had some negative experiences with charters that we haven't seen in Colorado. Uh, in Colorado, uh, we've seen them as a very constructive, innovative part of public education, uh, and there's enormous demand uh, for uh, d differentiated programs. And by the way, districts have learned from practices in charter schools, and districts have improved and offered new programming in district schools as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate your commitment to doing the right thing for students, and I uh, would encourage you to have uh, conversations with uh, some who are uh, less willing to take that same approach. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, lady, uh, lady Yields, back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Kiley, is recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon. Sheriff, could you please uh, summarize the ways that the cartels are involved in illegal border crossings? So... You have the Jalisco New Generation in Baja, California. Then you have the Sinaloa Cartel in Sonora, Mexico on our very southern border. So the Jalisco New Generation, theirs is the uh, movement of bodies that are coming across the river corridor. 
So they are the ones that are coordinating. They actually have contacts in different countries that have been identified as being the travel agents, for lack of a better term, to get the people here and to be able to control that coming across. So right now, between midnight and 4 a.m., 40 at a time come across down by the river corridor. So the Sinaloa cartel, they are the ones that are doing the narcotic side of it. So they coordinate between those that can afford and cannot afford to be able to pay the price. And they utilize those people to smuggle the narcotics in, whether it's on a vehicle through the port of entry or whether it's through the remote deserts of our county. Thank you. So would it be fair to say that the relaxation of, uh, of border policies uh, has uh, redounded to the benefit of the cartels? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just to be blunt, it's been a bonanza for them, right? It's expanded their business opportunities for their criminal, criminal enterprises, has it not? Absolutely. And they, they have scouts that are in our mountains, so they can watch Border Patrol's actions out in the remote part of our desert, so they can coordinate the, uh, the loads getting through, whether they're human or narcotics. <laughs> So we know who's benefiting, and so then we have to ask, who's paying the price? Well, first, of course, is the victims of fentanyl. In 2020, Border uh, Patrol seized 4,800 pounds. 2021, it was 11,200. 2022 fiscal year, it was 14,700. And in just the first four months for the 2023 fiscal year, 12,500. I have a chart here showing basically a quadrupling in overdoses uh, here in Yuma just over the course of a few years, and of course this is not a localized uh, matter. Uh, throughout the country, fentanyl poisoning is now the leading cause of death for young people, more than car accidents, more than suicides, uh, more than anything. Uh, Sheriff, is it your opinion that fewer Americans would be dying of fentanyl poisoning if the border was as secure as it was at the start of this administration? Absolutely. In addition to the victims of fentanyl, we then have the victims of human trafficking uh, as well. Uh, and uh, Supervisor, I believe we discussed earlier some evidence that you've seen of the increases in the impact of human trafficking uh, here in Yuma. Yeah, so in the first three months, we've seen a 350% uptick in human trafficking, people who have come forward seeking assistance uh, on their own, who have declared that they have been trafficked. And if nine were willing to do it, I'm sure that there are many more out there um, looking to, to free themselves of, of that bondage. Sheriff, is it your opinion that fewer people would be suffering through the horror of human trafficking if the border was as secure as it was at the start of this administration? Absolutely. And then we have the migrants themselves. In 2022, 856 died attempting to cross the border. That was 300, 300 more than it was in 2021, and three times as many as it was just in 2020. Sheriff, is it your opinion that fewer migrants would be dying crossing the border if the border was as secure as it was at the start of this administration? Yes, sir. So there you have it. We have a set of policies that has been a bonanza for the cartels, for foreign criminal organizations, and this windfall is being underwritten by pain and suffering and death. That's why this is not a partisan issue. You know, usually we have to weigh costs and benefits, we have to adjudicate uh, competing values, but here it's just bad all the way around. It's negative on both sides of the ledger. And so how does this make any sense? Well, it really only makes sense when you look at it from a political perspective. We had a set of border policies that was working. Everyone here will tell you that. And this administration came into office and in order to make a political statement, not only reversed those policies, but swung the pendulum radically in the other direction, exploding whatever bipartisan consensus there was on this issue and ushering in a crisis unlike we have seen in American history. So I'm not interested in criticizing our colleagues on the other side of the dais for not being here. I want to encourage them to come here, talk to the supervisor, talk to the sheriff, talk to the hospital, see what we have seen, and I want to work with anyone who is interested in getting this crisis under control. That includes the president, who I implore to accept responsibility, to admit his policies have failed, to find a new Secretary of Homeland Security, and let's all work together to replace pro-cartel policies with pro-America policies.
Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh has announced his intention to leave the Biden administration. And reports suggest Deputy Secretary Julie Sue is the leading candidate to replace him. As chair of the House Subcommittee on Workforce Protections, I am urging President Biden in the strongest terms not to appoint Julie Sue to this important cabinet post. Prior to joining the Biden Labor Department, Sue was California's Secretary of Labor under Governor Gavin Newsom. To say that she failed the people of California in that role would be an extreme understatement. I was serving in the State Assembly during her tenure. I witnessed firsthand failures on a scale that no state in this country has ever experienced. I've already sent a coalition letter from members of the California congressional delegation to President Biden, urging him to nominate someone, anyone, other than Sue. Today, I will expand on the points we raised in that letter. The amount of suffering Sue's Labor Department inflicted on my constituents and millions of Californians needs to be understood by the President and by every Senator who would be voting on her nomination. Specifically, I'll be discussing three main failures in her tenure in California, each of which is independently disqualifying. First, under her supervision, California's unemployment office, known as the EDD, failed to deliver benefits to millions of Californians. Second, at the same time, thanks to Sue's gross negligence, the EDD allowed the largest fraud of taxpayer dollars in history. Third, Sue helped destroy the careers of thousands of California freelancers as an architect of a labor law that effectively bans independent work. Let's start first by looking at the EDD's staggering failures under Sue's watch to perform its basic function of, de of delivering benefits to the unemployed. Now, California had the highest or second highest unemployment rate in the entire country through most of the COVID-19 era. This, in itself, could be seen as a significant failing of the state's Secretary of Labor. What was even worse is that those people who lost their paychecks on the government's orders, millions of Californians, had to wait weeks, months, or in some cases indefinitely they were entitled to the law. Now, in fairness, the COVID shutdown presented unemployment departments with unprecedented demands, and a number of states struggled to keep up. But what happened in California under Sue's management is simply without comparison. An estimated 5 million claims were delayed, many for months on end. An estimated 1 million people were wrongfully denied benefits. As a result, many of my constituents were left helpless, with no income, no ability to provide for their families. Many became dependent on food banks, had to cut back on basic necessities, had to dip into their life savings or take on debt. For example, in late April of 2020, my office received a call from a woman named Emily, who was inconsolable, saying she was on the brink of giving up hope. She was out of work, and her EDD claim had been pending for a month. She had no money, no way to pay her bills or put food on the table. I just can't do this anymore, she said, adding she couldn't hang on the governor's promises anymore. We later learned the agency had made a basic processing error, denying her claim and not even telling her. I could provide hundreds of other stories just like this. At times during 2020, my office would open dozens of new cases every day from constituents who could not get their benefits. We heard from folks who would call the EDD hundreds of times with no answer, who received notices with someone else's social security number, someone else's employer, someone else's earnings, who would wait weeks, months, or forever for their benefits. The level of service was worse than anything I had ever seen in government, eclipsing the very worst horror stories of bureaucratic ineptitude. By one estimate, only one in a thousand people would reach a live person when they tried to call the EDD. Sometimes, after finally getting through, the caller would be abruptly hung up on. The callback option routinely failed, with people requesting a callback and then not getting one. Often, no reason was given for benefit denials, and when one was, was given, it often didn't make sense. One claimant had an electronic application denied as ineligible, an electronic, as, as illegible, I should say, an electronic application. San Francisco Assemblyman David Chu, a Democrat, started a hashtag featuring the worst of these incidents. He called it hashtag EDD fail of the day. 
Months went by with no progress made. And you don't need to take my word for it. In July of 2020, 61 of the 80 members of the California Assembly, mostly Democrats, wrote as follows. In our fifth month of the pandemic, with so many constituents yet to receive a single unemployment, unemployment payment, it's clear that EDD is failing California. Millions of our constituents have had no income for months. As Californians wait for answers from EDD, they have depleted their life savings, they've gone into extreme debt, and are in deep panic as they figure out how to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. The lawmakers went on to explain how the EDD time and again failed to take responsibility and failed to correct its mistakes. They wrote that they had been met with long-winded excuses, fumbling nod answers, or unclear and ins inconsistent data, along with a, quote, lack of transparency and accountability, even, quote, obfuscation and dishonesty in their dealings with the agency. We have, ex have exhausted all avenues at our disposal, they said, as the agency had addressed only a few of the many issues we have highlighted for months, and it was only scratching the surface of the disaster that is the EDD. Those are the words of the Democrat supermajority in the legislature, the disaster that is the EDD. The legislators lamented, quote, how little has improved at EDD over the course of the pandemic. Independent reports would soon confirm the extent of the agency's mismanagement and deception. While the EDD had said in July of 2020 that its claims backlog would be cleared by September, a report found 1.5 million claims remained unresolved and the backlog was increasing by 10,000 each week. The Independent Legislative Analyst Office found the EDD mischaracterized the crisis repeatedly to the legislature. For instance, the EDD claimed 705,000 claims were denied when the real number was 3.4 million. Under Julie Su, California's unemployment office became the national poster child for government failure. Su failed to prevent avoidable problems, failed to address the crisis as it spiraled out of control, and failed to honestly acknowledge problems after the fact. Millions of Californians paid the price. And it bears emphasizing that these were people who had lost their jobs on the government's orders and had been paying in to the very system that was now failing them. Even allies of the governor and Secretary Sue concluded, concluded that she was responsible. Democrat Assemblymember Connie Petrie Norris, who is chairwoman of the Assembly Accountability and Administrative Review Committee, said that Sue has not done a good job at running the Employment Development Department, saying Sue's mismanagement, quote, caused heartbreak for millions of Californians. That's the first reason, that heartbreak for millions, why President Biden should not even consider elevating Deputy Secretary Sue. The second independent basis for disqualification is the historic fraud of taxpayer dollars that occurred on her watch. As so many hardworking citizens waited in vain for the checks they were owed by the EDD, there was one group of claimants for whom the delivery of benefits was swift and seamless, prisoners and fraudsters who were not entitled to them. In the largest fraud of taxpayer dollars in history, an estimated $32 billion was wrongfully paid out from the EDD to state prison inmates and international crime syndicates. Payments were made to murderers, rapists, and child molesters. 133 death row inmates collected over $400,000. These hardened criminals didn't have to try hard. They used names like Diane Feinstein and John Doe without raising an eyebrow. The district attorney of Sacramento County called the scheme, quote, relatively easy. The scale of this fraud boggles the mind. It equates to over $800 per person in California. The amount of money wasted was enough to pay the annual salary of 330,000 teachers in California. You could end world hunger with this kind of money. But instead, where did the money go? It went to the worst of the worst, funding organized crime both domestically and internationally. This $32 billion was used not to help citizens who had lost their jobs or to pay teachers or to end hunger, but to fund further criminal activities. And it was easily preventable. Nothing even close to this happened in any other state. The reason it happened in California was Secretary Julie Su. She made the inexplicable decision to forego a basic fraud prevention system. 
She ignored the federal government's guidance that claims be cross-checked against the prison rules, which was standard practice in other states. The agency sent hundreds of benefit cards to the same address, sent cards directly to correctional facilities, issues, issued benefits to infants and centenarians. The district attorney of Sacramento County called the EDD's response to the fraud, quote, slow and non-existent, and advised to look to other states for solutions. Fresno County's district attorney said the administration did nothing until the elected district attorneys brought it to the media, adding she did not think the state, quote, has a handle on it. Riverside County's district attorney said, quote, I don't know who was at the wheel. The chairwoman of the state assembly committee responsible for overseeing the EDD, a Democrat, decried the failure to follow, quote, simple and obvious steps that are implemented across the country. She added, it's absurd. This is outrageous. Perhaps most outrageous of all, as the district attorneys who uncovered the fraud put it, Fraudulent unemployment claims deny those who have lost their employment, many due to COVID-19, who are legally eligible for benefits and are truly in need from getting the financial assistance they need. Assemblyman David Chu, David Chu, a Democrat from San Francisco, summed it up this way. It's egregious that my constituents make a single typo that holds up their EDD benefits for months while an inmate on death row can use a fake name and still get benefits paid out. As if these first two reasons were not enough, the heartbreak for millions and the waste of billions, Deputy Secretary Sue should not be elevated to the Biden cabinet for a third independent reason. As California's Secretary of Labor, she championed and ruthlessly enforced a labor law that has been called one of the most destructive pieces of legislation in the past 20 years. And it wasn't me that called it that. This quote came from Gavin Newsom's own former Deputy Chief of Staff, Yoshar Ali, who added, it's truly horrific how many people have been negatively impacted by the law. That law, AB5, effectively bans independent work of any kind. While it was promoted as a way to convert rideshare drivers to the status of W-2 employees, the law has ensnared hundreds of professions videographers and caricaturists, transcriptionists and interpreters, technicians and engineers, analysts and consultants, musicians and conductors, artists and dancers, writers and editors, coaches and trainers, teachers and tutors, nurses and doulas, hardly an industry or trade is unscathed. It is a law so bad that effective ind affected industries have had to lobby the legislature for exceptions, over a hundred of which have been granted, but only to those with enough influence. Countless other Californians, spanning hundreds of professions, remain subject to the law and have lost their ability to earn, ability to earn a living in our state or had their professional options severely restricted. In fact, many national companies now explicitly disclaim on their applications that they can no longer work with California freelancers. In many professions, independent contracting is the only viable business model. In others, it is much preferred thanks to the flexibility and freedom it affords. But regardless, the blunt instrument of AB5 forbids it. Most devastated by this law are the most vulnerable. Seniors, caregivers, students, reformed convicts, single mothers, people with disabilities or health issues or mental health needs, all of whom rely on independent contracting to balance work with their personal life circumstances. Consider just a few testimonials of Californians whose lives have been upended by the law. A woman named Jody said, I worked years to gain my skill as an American Sign Language interpreter. It was my goal since I was nine years old. After AB5, I lost all three of my agencies. The dream I worked for is lost. I can't provide for my family, and thousands of California deaf won't be serviced. Andy said, I, worked with un I work with underserved artists of color. None of my career as an artist, technician, designer, and producer would have been possible under AB5. Artists of color will be less able to create their own work. Megan said, I am a nurse practitioner. AB5 is widening the gap in healthcare as small rural practices that can only be staffed with contractors shut their doors. Setting my own schedule has allowed me to spend time with my children that I will no longer be able to. Daniel said, I am a chiropractor in California. I was just terminated from my wonderful independent contract, 10 hours per week job. The company cited AB5. 
I've had this job for 10 years. The job allowed me flexibility to take care of my three special needs kids. Now it's gone. Jared said AB5 forced me to shut down my business. I went from making $80,000 per year in home services to a minimum wage employee. My family trade is gone. I've gone from working four days a week to spend time with my kids to not knowing if I can make ends meet working seven days. Kathy said, I'm a 71-year-old transcriber. I raised six kids and went to work in my 40s, but I had to retire at 62 due to health issues. I depend on my at-home transcription pay to survive and pay my bills. For eight years, I did okay until AB5. AB and Barbara said, I'm a proofreader. Competition is fierce and it's hard to get clients, but I did it. I was thrilled to choose jobs I was best suited for and to work when I wanted. After AB5, Californians need not apply. Julie Sue has been called an architect of this law. After its enactment, she used her position as California Secretary of Labor to ruthlessly enforce it. Here's what Sue said in her own words. She said the way to enforce AB5 is just doing investigations and audits. That will be on both wages and tax, she went on. She said, so we will be doing investigations and audits so that those who want to comply with the need to reclassify can do so, and those who won't will understand that that's not the kind of economy we want in California. Think about how callous those words are, just wiping out hundreds of professions, countless people. That's not the kind of economy we want in California, she said. She went on to say, so we can issue citations, and demand both wages and taxes and other kinds of penalties. Sue shamelessly kicked this harassment strategy into high gear after the COVID shutdowns began. She even defied the will of Congress in the process in one of the most disgraceful episodes of the COVID era. In Congress had provided benefits to independent contractors through the CARES Act and put states in charge of distributing those benefits. Yet under held those benefits as she aimed to exploit this sudden need that independent contractors had to interface with her department. It called the People versus AB5, which was run by four self-described Democrats who support unions but were opponents of the law, explained Sue's scheme. They wrote that the EDD, quote, attempted to weaponize the COVID-19 crisis by leading out-of-work Californians into a trap. Instead of giving them access to benefits, Congress, to the benefits Congress had included for independent contractors in the CARES Act, the EDD tried to shoehorn them into the regular unemployment system, where they would then have to name the names of their business partners. Then, once it had that list, the EDD would launch audits of the named businesses for allegedly violating AB5 and would hit them with fines ranging from $5,000 to $25,000 per, quote, misclassification. And this would be applied retroactively to before the law even existed. The website gave an example of a small princess for your little girl's birthday party business whose owner was audited and fined $60,000 dating back several years. Incredibly, as small businesses were on their last legs, the EDD plowed ahead with these harassing audits using personnel that could have been processing unemployment claims or detecting fraud. The worst consequence of all this was that countless freelancers forced out of work by AB5, COVID, or some combination of the two had to wait weeks or months for benefits as Sue's department played its political games. You don't need to take my word for this. Congress, California Congressman Adam Schiff wrote a letter to Secretary Sue in April of 2020, rebu rebuking her for failing to release the benefits independent contractors were owed under the CARES Act. Schiff wrote as follows, I represent thousands of independent freelance contract and gig workers, including many in the entertainment industry, who often do not fully qualify for standard unemployment benefits. The CARES Act, which was signed into law two weeks ago, dramatically expands unemployment coverage, and I led an effort in the House to extend this coverage to non-traditional and independent workers. As states are now working to implement these expanded federal benefits, I am hearing from many of my newly eligible constituents who are concerned because they are not yet able to apply and who are increasingly worried as their financial responsibilities continue to mount without anticipated income. It is little wonder that the coalition behind AB5 has issued a letter endorsing Sue 
to be President Biden's new Secretary of Labor. The letter signed by the California Laborers Federation, SCIU California, the California Teachers Association, among others, begins, there is no one more qualified to help lead. They know exactly where she would lead the country, down the same disastrous path, disastrous path as California, something her former boss, Gavin Newsom, has explicitly called for, saying California is a model for the nation, promising to highlight California's, quote, policy innovations so they can be scaled up nationally. Given Julie Su's role as an architect and enforcer of AB5, there is no doubt that as US Secretary of Labor, she would do everything in her power and likely things not properly in her power to nationalize the law and its destructive consequences. In fact, there are already two vehicles for doing so. The PRO Act, which passed the House last year, would cost at least 350,000 freelance workers their ability to earn a living. And at this moment, the Department of Labor has a proposed rule that would similarly threaten the livelihood of independent contractors nationwide. This is not a trivial matter. 57 million Americans engage in freelance work. They deserve a Secretary of Labor who defends their freedom to work and respects them as professionals. Julie Su's track record suggests she would be a secretary who does just the opposite. President Biden faces a very clear choice. Does he want a secretary of labor who will fight for workers, taxpayers, and citizens, or does he want the hand-selected rubber stamp of special interest groups? This is a moment of vital importance for the American workforce. We are coming out of an era of unprecedented upheaval and heading towards an era of unpredictable transformation. The position of Secretary of Labor cannot be treated as a gift to special interests. It cannot be occupied by someone who has harmed so many workers in so many ways. It cannot be consumed by the incompetence and corruption that Californians are all too familiar with. I urge President Biden to cease consideration of Julie Su for Labor Secretary and to appoint a new secretary who is competent and qualified who is pro-worker and pro-small business, who will work with Democrats and Republicans alike, who will unleash our economic potential rather than suppress it, and who understands that it is ingenuity and hard work, not the heavy hand of government, that has made the American workforce the greatest engine for progress the world has ever known. Thank you, and I yield. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to just uh, return uh, to the uh, oversight plan uh, as proposed, which includes a section on freedom of speech, uh, including efforts by some colleges. The subcommittee will examine restraints on free speech, including efforts by some colleges and universities to limit protests, speeches, distribution of literature, petitions, and other expressive activities. Now, the uh, ranking member proposed eliminating uh, the oversight related to the suppression of free speech at colleges and universities, uh, and uh, the individual proposing this amendment uh, supported that change, uh, which is ironic because the place in American society where anti-Semitism has been most pronounced, where, really where it's been emanating from, uh, is our universities. And a favored tool of the forces of anti-Semitism at our universities is to silence uh, pro-Israel views and to make Jewish students and speakers feel unwelcome and excluded from campus life. It's so extreme that just this last fall, nine student groups at Berkeley Law School actually amended their bylaws to prohibit speakers who expressed support uh, for Israel. This was condemned by uh, the American Jewish Committee and 35 other Jewish organizations as a vicious attempt to marginalize and stigmatize the Jewish, Israeli, and pro-Israel community. This is unabashed anti-Semitism, they said. In fact, this action has now led to a lawsuit alleging uh, that it violates Title VI of the Federal Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin at programs that receive federal assistance. As a state representative, I proposed legislation to protect freedom of speech on college campuses, and the leading supporters were dozens of Jewish American groups 
because they have experienced the nexus between the suppression of free speech at our universities uh, and rising anti-Semitism. So I'm sorry, but it's really hard for me to accept this proposed amendment as anything more than a political stunt when the individual who is proposing it just himself voted to limit oversight of a leading source of anti-Semitism in this country. Will Thank the gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yield? Yes, I yield. So if I understand the gentleman's point, because the gentleman's concerned about anti-Semitism on college campuses, a concern, by the way, that I share, he's going to oppose an amendment that would ask us to oversee acts of anti-Semitism. Uh, others uh, of my colleagues, apparently, uh, similarly will oppose the amendment. Um, and I suppose the rationale would be, if this were a resolution on the floor condemning anti-Semitism, they would oppose that too, because it doesn't include other forms of hate. Uh, I hardly see how the presence of acts that my colleague from California and I would both disagree with that have an anti-Semitic character should be used to justify opposition to an amendment that says we should oversee domestic terrorism motivated by all forms of bigotry, including anti-Semitism. Uh, to me, uh, the one does not lead to the other. Rather, it ought to lead to support for the amendment, not opposition. And I yield back to the gentleman. Now I require my time and yield to Mr. Bach. For 60 minutes as the design designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've had a series of very heavy storms in California. We've gotten a lot of water. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about what is happening to that water. This is a photo I took a few days ago at the Folsom Dam. 20,000 cubic feet is being released per second, where it is sent on its way to the Pacific Ocean. That staggering amount of water is not available to California farmers, businesses, or residents. Meanwhile, state-sponsored billboards tell people to put a bucket of water in their shower so they can save, they put a bucket in their, wa a bucket in their shower so they can save that water for gardening. Restaurants are prohibited from serving their customers drinking water unless the customers specifically ask for it. Here are some of the other emergency drought restrictions that have been in effect. Turn off decorative water fountains. Use an automatic shutoff nozzle on your water hose. Use a broom, not water, to clean sidewalks and driveways. Commercial, industrial, and institutional decorative grass should not be watered. Same for the common areas in homeowner associations. Down here you can see all the enforcement, all the penalties that if you don't follow this. It says here for local jurisdictions, uh, for urban water suppliers, if needed, exercise authority to adopt more stringent local conservation member, measures. Some local authorities have done just that. The Los Virginis Unit, Municipal Water District began sending government employees into residents' homes to install flow restrictors. Once installed, you're also barred from watering anything outside, and you're not able to use two appliances needing water at once. One resident said you have to take what's called a Navy shower, two minutes. In Los Angeles, they have the water police, where municipalities pay individuals to drive around and check for leaky sw swimming pools, green lawns, or other signs of water use. This is just the beginning. In 2018, the California legislature adopted a statewide limit of 55 gallons of indoor water use per person per day. So a single person living alone can't take a shower and do a load of laundry in the same day. Yet last year, the legislature decided even this was too generous and reduce the allotted water to 42 gallons per day. Then, of course, there's the impact on farmers. For both 2021 and 2022, surface water deliveries dropped by 43%. An estimated 752,000 acres lay idle in 2022. The uh, general manager of the Glen Calusa Irrig Irrigation District said, we typically plant 100,000 acres of rice in our district, and this last year, we planted 1,000 acres. It's just a massive, massive impact, he said. As a result, $1.7 billion in crop revenues were lost in 2022 and an estimated 
400 jobs. These drastic sacrifices have been required of Californians because of a supposed lack of water. We prayed for rain, and then the rain comes, and this happens. Here is the overall impact of this image and others like it throughout the state. So far this year, October through mid-March, the net outflow, this is after pumping, from the Delta into the San Francisco Bay is 11.6 million acre feet. Meanwhile, the state has only pumped 1.2 million, 1.0 uh, million acre feet into the California aqueduct, and the Federal Bureau of Reclamation has only pumped 826,000 acre feet into the Delta Mandata Canal. So with this record precipitation, that means 13% of Delta outflows have been captured. The rest is squandered. If we were able to capture this water, we wouldn't have to worry about floods. And we wouldn't have to worry about droughts. Communities wouldn't be put at risk. Farmers wouldn't have to fallow their fields. Citizens wouldn't have to take shorter showers. The reason we aren't capturing it isn't because this water is somehow inherently elusive. It's because there's simply no place to put it. California has not seen a new water storage project in at least 30 years, despite many promising potential projects that have been in the planning stages since the 1950s. In 2014, California voters said enough is enough and passed a $7.5 billion water bond. Build water storage, the voters said, yet nothing has been built. In the nine years since, no significant project has materialized. Endless litigation, mind-numbing bureaucracy, and most of all, a lack of political will have been a recipe for inaction. The executive director of the most significant project, Sites Reservoir, said that in my experience, my experience is that for every one year of construction, you have about three years of permitting. It doesn't need to be this way. The massive Folsom Dam, of which this is the auxiliary spillway, holds about a million acre feet of water and took less than a decade in the late 1940s and early 1950s to build. In addition to failing to build any new in-stream or off-stream reservoirs, California has also rejected all but one proposed desalination plant and is taking advantage of a small fraction of the potential for water treatment. And even now, amidst the current record precipitation, our state and federal pumps still aren't operating at full capacity. In short, this uniquely Californian absurdity of alternating or even simultaneous floods and droughts is not some inevitable byproduct of our climate or geography. It is the direct product of political failure. We have more than enough tools at our disposal to have a sustainable, secure supply of water for all users. This image needs to be a wake-up call for California's leaders at the state and federal level. No more excuses. Let's solve this problem now. Let's end this era of floods and droughts, of shorter showers and fallow fields. Let's liberate our constituents from this regime of enforced scarcity and give Californians the abundant supply of water they deserve. This is California's problem but it affects the entire country. California agriculture feeds the nation and the world. And we could never have become the state that we are, or at least once were, a state that used to lead the country in so many good ways, without the dams, aqueducts, pipes, tunnels, canals, plants, pumping stations built by previous generations. We need to summon the can-do spirit of our forebearers. And we don't even need their ingenuity. We just need basic competence. Effective water management was indispensable to California's 20th century rise and is just as indispensable to reversing its 21st century decline.
Madam Speaker, this last week, two court decisions in California delivered a near fatal blow to one of the worst laws that has ever been passed, the California law known as AB5, that destroyed the livelihoods of countless people, wiping out hundreds of professions in our state. These court decisions have significant ramifications for three matters of national importance. First, the recently reintroduced PRO Act, which seeks to nationalize California's ban on independent work. Second, a proposed Department of Labor rule that seeks to do much the same thing through the bureaucracy. And third, the upcoming confirmation hearings for President Biden's nominee for Secretary of Labor, Julie Su, who as California's Labor Secretary was an architect and lead enforcer of AB5. The PRO Act, the Labor Rule, Julie Su. It's a multi-pronged assault on the right to earn a living in America, a concerted strategy to limit or eliminate the gig economy, freelancing, independent contracting, self-employment, and other alternate work arrangements that entire careers are based on and entire industries have been built around. If this strategy is successful, it will be devastating for the American economy and American workers. We know that because of the devastation California has already experienced. When he signed AB5 in late 2019, Governor Gavin Newsom rendered countless Californians spanning hundreds of professions unable to earn a living in our state. Videographers and caricaturists, transcriptionists and interpreters, technicians and engineers, analysts and consultants, musicians and conductors, artists and dancers, writers and editors, coaches and trainers, teachers and tutors, nurses and doulas, hardly an industry or profession is unscathed. And the consequences go well beyond just the affected professions. To take one example, thousands and thousands of truckers are at risk of being taken off the road, throwing supply chains into chaos. AB5 is a law so bad that California voters have repudiated it, repudiated it and the legislature has granted over 100 exemptions to prof professions with enough influence at the Capitol. These two developments, the clearly expressed will of California voters and the scattershot exemption process, were the subjects of last week's court decisions. In the first decision, the California Court of Appeal unanimously upheld Proposition 22, an initiative passed by California voters in 2020. Prop 22 repealed AB5 for one category of independent contractors, app-based drivers. Uber, to take one example, was going to have to terminate up to 80% of its drivers because of AB5 and nearly had to stop operating in our state altogether. Their drivers who prized the flexibility of being able to simply switch on the app whenever they want to work were appalled at the prospect of being assigned to fixed shifts, minimum work requ hour requirements, and more if they were able to drive at all. So Prop 22 was proposed to preserve the independent contracting model for these drivers and enable services like Uber and Lyft to continue in California. In November, 2022, Prop 20, uh, November 2020, Prop 22 passed overwhelmingly with 59% of the vote. This is the one time that AB5 has been subject to a direct vote of the people, and California voters decisively rejected it. Yet tellingly, the special interest groups behind AB5 then tried to defy the will of voters, tying up the initiative in arcane legal challenges. But last Tuesday, a state appellate court put an end to this anti-democratic nonsense. The court respected the will of voters and upheld the initiative. The justices acknowledged the people of California had chosen to overturn AB5 and protect independent contracting. So for the dozens of Democrat members of Congress sponsoring the PRO Act, take notice, your position is at odds with the voters of even my own very blue state. There was a second decision on AB5 last week of perhaps even greater significance. This one, also a unanimous ruling, was from a federal appeals court. Overruling a district court decision, 
the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held in favor of independent contractors who alleged AB 5 violates the United States Constitution. Specifically, it is an equal protection violation. By granting over 100 exemptions to AB 5, the court wrote, the legislature has not only refuted its own justification for the law, but it has picked and chosen who is allowed to work and who isn't without any rational basis. Indeed, the court referred to the, quote, piecemeal fashion in which the exemptions were granted, saying this, quote, lends credence to plaintiff's allegations that exemptions were the result of a lobbying and backroom dealing as opposed to adherence to the stated purpose of the legislation. The court wrote that who is subject to the law and who isn't could plausibly be, quote, attributed to animus rather than reason and that the state's policy of now enforcing AB 5 on some but not others borders on corruption, pure spite, or naked favoritism. For this reason, the court found that the constitutional case against AB 5 passes the rational basis test, which is notoriously difficult to pass. Under that standard, a court will only strike down a law if there is not any reasonably conceivable state of facts that could provide a rational basis for it. In this case, the court explained that even under the, this fairly forgiving standard of review, we conclude that plaintiffs plausibly alleged that AB 5 violates the Equal Protection Clause. Why in the world would a law that per the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals lacks any rational basis be transformed into national policy, ensnaring millions of Americans in its web of corruption, animus, and economic failure? Why would we take a law so bad that legislatures felt the need to unconstitutionally award 100 exemptions to their friends and say this is our model for the American workforce? There is no good reason at all. No good reason why a law that the voters of Deep, Califor Deep Blue California rejected should be the template for national labor relations as the PRO Act seeks to do. No reason why a law that cannot be justified by any reason reasonably conceivable state of facts should be imposed by executive fiat nationwide, as the Biden administration's labor rule would do. And no reason why an architect and ruthless enforcer of that law, former California Labor Secretary Julie Hsu, should be elevated to the highest labor office in the land. Julie Hsu's historic failure to deliver unemployment checks to millions of Californians, along with her allowance of the largest fraud of taxpayer dollars in history, are easily disqualifying from the standpoint of competence. But it is her mistreatment of California workers through the ruthless enforcement of AB5, even during the COVID shutdowns, that truly makes her unfit for this position. The voters of California repudiated Julie Su with the passage of Prop 22. Two separate appeals courts repudiated Su with last week's decisions. It is time for President Biden to withdraw this nomination, and if he refuses, I urge the United States Senate to join California voters, California judges, and federal judges in rejecting this nominee. Madam Speaker, in recent weeks, my district has lost several of its most distinguished citizens. I wanted to share a few words about their lives and the legacy they have left in our communities. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to honor the life and memory of Rex Heim, a committed public service, first servant, veteran, native Californian, and friend to many. Rex's life was guided by a commitment to serving others and a work hard, play hard attitude that endeared him to people across California. In fact, Rex's habit of regularly walking the halls of the state capitol in Sacramento and testifying in a Hawaiian shirt rather than the customary suit and tie was by some accounts single-handedly responsible for relaxing the dress code at the capitol building, which is appreciated by many. Rarely would Rex let a meeting or conference call end without making everyone laugh and lightening the mood of the conversation. Rex also spread joy to others through serving as the chair, vice chair, and board member at the Calexpo Estate Fair for over 20 years. 
His passion for bringing joy to others through the fair was widely recognized as five different governors from both political parties continued to appoint Rex to the California State Fair Board. Rex's service to his community and country extended far beyond the fair. He served in both the Army Reserve and California National Guard, retiring as a major in 1990. Rex was also a member of the California Task Force on Violence Prevention, a regent of the University of California, and president of the Cal Og Aggie Alumni Association. Apart from his community work, Rex worked as president and CEO of the California Business Properties Association for 37 years, and was often instrumental in protecting taxpayers and helping craft legislation that served as models for states across the country. I am honored to have known Rex. He was a devoted husband and father, and our community in California will never impact, forget the impact that Rex Keim had and continues to have on our lives through his service, advocacy, and work throughout his 75 years. Madam Speaker, I rise to honor the memory of Martin Harmon, a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and beloved member of the Roseville community who passed away in February at the age of 88. Martin lifted the lives of thousands of members of the community through his charitable foundation, which supported hospitals, churches, cancer research, substance abuse programs, the arts, disaster relief efforts, and children's programs throughout the Sacramento area. He impressed upon his family the importance of making a positive difference and is survived by his cherished wife, Catherine Harmon, nine children, 33 grandchildren, and 29 great-grandchildren. Martin also embodied the American entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit. He started his career at age nine by selling cookware door-to-door -door during World War II and later parlayed his experience working behind a butcher's counter into opening his own market and meatpacking company as a teenager. At the age of 27, Martin purchased his first nursing home in Auburn, which presaged his future as a developer and contractor. Martin's wide-ranging developments, from medical office buildings and shopping centers to subdivisions and apartments, leave behind a profound legacy for his children and grandchildren. I was honored to know Martin, and our community will never forget the impact that Martin Harmon has had and will continue to have on our lives for many, many years to come. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to honor the life and memory of Dr. Paul Dugan, a committed physician and pillar of the Roseville community who sadly passed away in February at the age of 92. Dr. Dugan served countless members of the Roseville community and Sacramento area through his work as a physician. His passion for caring for others through medicine sparked by an early affliction of polio is abundantly clear through his life's work. Ever since moving to Roseville in 1963, Dr. Dugan regularly spent weekends making house calls and serving uninsured patients, friends of patients, and tirelessly advocating for public health awareness. Paul and his wife Olga even started the first ever mass CPR training program, Start a Heart, in 1978. The program ran continuously for 19 years and was later replicated as CPR Saturday across the country and internationally by the American Red Cross. Dr. Dugan doubtlessly saved countless lives through his leadership in organizing and executing the Start a Heart program and his service as a physician. Dr. Dugan's passion for serving others extended beyond medicine and beyond Roseville. Dr. Dugan served on the Roseville Planning uh, Commission, helping shape Roseville into the city it is today. He served as president of the Roseville Chamber of Commerce and was recognized by community members as Roseville Citizen of the Year in 1978 and 1992. Dr. Dugan was also selected to serve on the California Board of Medical Examiners by both Governor Ronald Reagan and Governor Jerry Brown and he assisted in credentialing the UC Davis School of Medicine. I was honored to know Paul, and our community will never forget Dr. Paul Dugan and the tremendous impact he has had on his patients as residents of Roseville through his service as a physician and leadership in the community. Madam Speaker, I rise to honor the memory of Greg Van Dusen, a pillar of the Sacramento area community. 
Greg was born in Sacramento in 1950, and from an early age had a passion for serving others and for sports. Greg's service and leadership was recognized by his peers after he served as student body president in 1968, and he later served a 12-month combat tour in Vietnam. After returning from Vietnam, Greg combined his passion for service and sports by working tirelessly to facilitate the move of the Sacramento Kings from Kansas City to Sacramento in 1985. As a result of Greg's efforts, generations of Sacramento area residents have become diehard Kings fans, although admittedly it's been pretty tough uh, in many recent years. Uh, but the team's uh, somewhat unexpected uh, success this season, I think, is a, is a tremendous tribute to Greg. Greg was also a devoted father and grandfather, helping shape his three sons into the men they are today. He always looked forward to visits from his grandkids, attending their sporting events, and teaching them life lessons. His son, Brett, remembers him as a brilliant mind, a hardworking, compassionate father and grandfather, and always willing to help anyone who asked. I was truly honored to know Greg. Uh, he, was, he was a good friend, and our community will never forget the impact that Greg Van Duden has had and will continue to have on our lives through his passion for serving others. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to honor the life and memory of Alan Zarenberg, a beloved member of the Sacramento area community and a kind-hearted public servant. Alan's impact has been felt for over 40 years at the California State Capitol, including for 23 years as president of the California Chamber of Commerce. Alan held a deep commitment to forging constructive compromise with anyone willing to help deliver results for the people of California, listening respectfully and kindly to everyone's opinions and building trust through honest deal making, the very embodiment of how politics ought to be practiced. His work, among many other results, helped ensure that significant investments were made in infrastructure and in caring for Californians' mental health. Allen also served several California governors in a variety of roles, including Governor George Duke Mason and Governor Pete Wilson. Allen also served our country as an Air Force officer during Vietnam. During the war, he was a captain and flight navigator in the KC-135, responsible for refueling spy planes. His time in the Air Force informed his approach throughout his life's work, from calmly managing a crisis to learning how to get the job done no matter the obstacles at hand. Apart from his service, Alan is also remembered as a kind individual, often making pizzas from scratch for friends at his home in Loomis. I was truly honored to, to know Alan, to work with Alan, and people throughout California will never forget the impact that he had and will continue to have for many, many years to come. Chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Kiley. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you for organizing this hearing uh, on such an important topic, uh, which the committee has very carefully laid out what happened. Uh, we had uh, the powers of the federal government, uh, counterterrorism powers, uh, uh, criminal powers, uh, law enforcement powers, uh, mobilized uh, for the purpose of restricting and chilling the most core protected form of speech, that is the right to petition your government and to try to seek changes. And on the most important of topics, the education of uh, one's children. And I had hoped this would have been a bipartisan effort towards accountability. After all, the National School Board Association, uh, which laid out the predicate for this whole thing with its letter, has apologized for it. Yet instead of a bipartisan inquiry into what happened here and what reforms we can make, uh, the other side of the dais has engaged in an exercise of whataboutism, saying, well, we're not going to even address this, but what about this whole other issue? And as we've learned in the course of this discussion, this other issue is really a red herring. So Ms. Johnson, language really matters, and you throw around terms like, uh, you know, book bans and censorship and gag orders. So I guess I'll just ask you, what in your view is the difference between banning books and selecting age-appropriate materials for classrooms? 
Thank you for the question. The, what we're seeing now in terms of banning, banning books, I'll, I'll back up a minute. PEN America defines a book ban as the removal of material that had been previously available for students, whether that material is being removed for a, as, as a permanent matter or for a review that sometimes turns into a long form review and ultimately ends in, or it results in, excuse me, the access to the book being removed. When we're talking about a book ban, what is happening is the government, the heavy hand of government coming in and saying that this book may no longer be accessed by children. Age appropriateness is a, is a different matter. When we're talking about age appropriateness, there are actually um, a number of, of frameworks that exist for this. There's a Lexile framework that talks about what, what books should be, um, how, how books should be categorized and what, what ages. There are publishers who talk about this book is for young adults, this book is for Sure. Children. So let's just take an example. You said mm -hmm. earlier that you think Mein Kampf should be available in classrooms. What I said is that Mein Kampf, the Communist Manifesto, and other such books are available in public and school libraries and should be so that we can learn about them in And should be. So did you school. mean for high school or elementary school? I, that is not for me to say, sir. I, I, I'm, I am not an expert in terms of the age appropriate. That's, that's fair. And so if Mein Kampf were not or, or were in elementary school and they decided we're not going to have it there anymore, would that be a book ban? If it had been in an elementary school and was removed for and was removed and placed in a high school, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think, it, I mean, look, it depends on the actual situation, and you're talking to someone who's, who's going to... You're right. I know, it but does you know, depend, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to... It does depend on the situation. It depends on the situation. So, clearly, you agree that there are some books that shouldn't be available to some grade levels. I think that, I think that from my perspective, as a parent, there are some books that I would not want my children to, to read. You might have a different perspective than I do. You might say those books are fine for parents. That's I right. I completely respect that. What my concern is, sir, is that when, if it, was, it, if it was my decision and I say, I want you to ban all these books, and the school board says, great, because she said so. That's what I don't want to happen, because it is not up to me. It is not up to me as one parent to dictate. That's right, and you have school boards who are making these decisions with input from the community. And so I just want you to be careful about the language that you use, because you as well uh, think it's appropriate to limit access to certain types of materials in classrooms. You just go ahead and say that anyone who disagrees with you on the particular limitations that are put in place uh, is guilty of banning books or violating the First Amendment when that just isn't the case. Now, on a related topic, uh, are you aware that right now schools are shut down in the Los Angeles Unified School District? I am aware of that. Yes. Because of yet another school shutdown and strike. And are you aware that in that school district, kids were out of class for uh, up to a year and a half? I was not aware of, I mean, are you, you mean during COVID? During COVID. And in many districts across the country, of course, schools were of shut course, down yeah. for extended periods. Mm -hmm. How many books did kids have access to inside of classrooms, inside of school libraries, uh, in those schools when they were shut down? That I don't know if there were, if there were ways to bring, the, if, if there were some students who had access to books that they were brought to them, that I, that I can't tell you. Certainly not very many, sir, I would think, is that, that right? There, I'm sorry? Certainly not very many books were available, is that right? Ostensibly, that would be correct. But there is a difference here between... Okay, I'm sorry on time. I'm sorry to cut you off. But I, I just want to say, uh, as you might be aware, Ms. Justice and parents uh, like her tried to get schools open. And we know at this point it was a catastrophic mistake to keep them closed. And that enabled students to have access to all the books that were there. You've been fighting. Your old testimony has been getting them access to a few more books. She got them access. They fought to get students access to all the books. So I just, would you like to take the opportunity to thank Ms. Justice and the other parent leaders for their efforts? I also know that Ms. Justice was a member of a school board, right, which I really appreciate. But I think the public service is incredibly important. Look, what we're okay, talking... Okay, wait, hold on, hold on. Gentlemen's time's expired. Thank I've got you. to move on. Uh, chair recognizes gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Job, this time has expired, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kelly. You're recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for organizing today's hearing uh, on protecting freedom of speech at the place where it's most vital, our institutions of higher learning. This really should not be a partisan issue in any way, shape, or form. If there's one thing that shouldn't be a partisan issue, uh, it should be this. We should fight about everything else, exercising our First Amendment rights. Uh, but freedom of speech itself is foundational uh, to the character 
of our country. And indeed, in just a few years ago, 2017, uh, in the California legislature, I authored a resolution affirming freedom of speech as a foundational campus value. The resolution encouraged universities across the state to adopt uh, the gold standard free speech statement, which is the University of Chicago Statement of Free Expression. Now, this is a Democrat supermajority in California, and it passed our legislature unanimously. This was just in 2017. In 2016, uh, President Barack Obama had this to say. He said, there's been a trend around the country of trying to get colleges to disinvite speakers with a different point of view or disrupt a politician's rally. Don't do that, Obama said, no matter how ridiculous or offensive you might find the things that come out of their mouths. There will be times when you shouldn't compromise your core values, your integrity, and you will have the responsibility to speak up in the face of injustice. But listen, engage. If the other side has a point, learn from them. If they're wrong, rebut them, teach them, beat them on the battlefield of ideas. And yet, a few years later, we continue to see incidents like we saw, well, just recently in California uh, at UC Davis and at uh, your university, uh, Mr. Joner, uh, Stanford. And uh, I understand you're the uh, executive editor of the Stanford uh, Re Review, is that right? Yes, I am. And uh, I understand your uh, publication has done some great work uh, covering the uh, attacks on free speech that have happened on campus. Thank you. I appreciate that. So what I want to ask you is about what the mentality you think is of the students who created these disruptions. Because you know, these are Stanford Law students, presumably uh, very bright. And yet we saw them so flagrantly defying the uh, admonition from former President Obama and uh, not even letting someone uh, of a vo opposing viewpoint speak. They seem to think that stopping the words from being expressed was the proper response to their uh, disagreement. So how do you think it is that some of the brightest students we have in this country uh, don't seem to understand this basic American value? Uh, absolutely, it's quite concerning. Um, so thank you for the, the, the question, Congressman. Um, Stanford Law School, I believe, is currently the second ranked law school in the country. Um, we, we know that these students will go on to be, you know, the next business leaders um, sitting in these very chairs one day and, and um, even at the su Supreme Court. I mean, these are the students that, that Stanford Law is graduating. But these students, and this was over 100 student protesters um, here, uh, completely disrupted Judge Duncan's speech. And uh, if you watch the video and, and read the details in, in my article or other articles, they're holding obscene signs, heckling obscene remarks um, that, that I wouldn't even in state here um, in this setting. Um, and so I, I don't know what has um, brought these students to, to, to take on this worldview that, that believes they can just shut down someone else's speech because they disagree with them or have said something controversial. Um, and so I, I've said we need university administrators in place to enforce it, and we absolutely do. Um, but we need them to, to educate these students on these principles, and we need these students to uphold these principles of free speech themselves. And, and maybe that starts early on. Um, it, it should happen in college, but maybe it needs to be something that's done um, and is not being well done uh, in, in early education. I think you're exactly right. I think that it starts uh, at the uh, you know, primary, secondary school level. We need to get back to teaching civics in a real way. Uh, but one thing I did find encouraging in the dean of your university's response, Jenny Martinez, is she said that uh, they're going to, one step the law school will take, we'll be holding a mandatory half-day session uh, for all students on the topic of freedom of speech and the norms of the legal profession. Uh, I think that this is a good idea. Now, it's not going to uh, compensate for the shortcomings we see at, our, uh, at, the, at the secondary and primary level around the country. Uh, but I think that the more universities that can do something like this, not necessarily in response to uh, you know, incidents that occur on campus, but just as a matter of your basic training, your basic orientation when you come to school, uh, I think that that'd be something uh, of great value. And, uh, and Mr. Chair, I think that'd be perhaps something that we could look at as a committee as to how we can encourage that sort of education about the importance of the First Amendment and free speech at our universities. Thank you, and I yield back. For five minutes. Madam Speaker, currently California businesses are facing a significant tax increase, thanks in part to a high-ranking state official who allowed the tax dollars they'd already paid to be stolen. It's an incompetence tax, a price private citizens are being forced to pay for their government's failures. 
I'd like to take a moment to explain how this happened. But I'll lead with the punchline. The state official who squandered these funds, allowing a fraud of historic proportions, is somehow now up for a major promotion. President Biden has nominated Julie Su, former head of the California Labor and Workforce Development Agency, to be the next US Secretary of Labor. The predicament that small businesses in California now find themselves in, facing double taxation to compensate for the government's singular negligence, is another example of why this nomination is so ill-considered. It is a warning as to what all Americans have in store if Julie Su is confirmed. Stepping back, the California Unemployment Insurance Fund is the source for paying out unemployment insurance claims honored by California's unemployment office, known as the EDD. The fund is ordinarily maintained through a tax levied on California businesses. New employers are assigned a 3.4% UI rate for two to three years, and after that, a business's contribution tax varies. It's somewhere between 1.5 and 6.2% for the current year. In times of economic duress, when the fund is paying out significantly more than is coming in, the federal government has the option of loaning money to states to cover the payment deficit. California had to take out such a loan during the COVID business shutdowns and took on by far the most debt of any state. The current debt amounts to $18.8 billion. This was because of the huge volume of claims, yes, but also because of a staggering amount of fraud. A coalition letter from dozens of chambers of commerce in California notes, the Unemployment Development Office proved ill-equipped for the rapid increase in claimants. After numerous oversight hearings and analyses of EDD's failings, it is clear that EDD's failings added further to the UI fund's insolvency. By failing to prevent fraud and instead distributing funds to fraudulent claimants, and by mistakenly distrib distributing overpayments to legitimate claim overpayments to legitimate claimants. The letter goes on, although EDD and local law enforcement have attempted to recover some of these mistaken distributions, recovery rates appear to be less than 10% of the mistaken distributions. In other words, these mistakes at EDD added to the UI fund deficit. The total scale of EDD fraud in California is estimated at $32.6 billion. This unprecedented loss was almost entirely preventable if Julie Su had taken basic fraud prevention measures. A January 2021 report from the California State Auditor notes that the EDD fraud occurred for three main reasons. First, EDD waited about four months to automate a key anti-fraud measure. Second, EDD allowed claimants to collect benefits even though they were using suspicious addresses. In one case, over 1,700 claims came from a single address. Third, EDD removed a key safeguard against improper payments without fully understanding the significance of the safeguard. Further, the state auditor reports EDD did not bolster its fraud detection measures until months into the pandemic despite repeated warnings and did not reliably track suspicious claims and resolution to determine the effectiveness of its fraud prevention tools. By the way, if you're wondering where all this money, $32.6 billion, went, the CEO of LexisNexis Risk Solutions has this to say, 70% of that money left California. It left this country. It went to transnational criminal groups that have used that money for nefarious purposes to harm our democracy. Some of that money has been used in sex trafficking and child extortion. At this point, California is one of only four states in the country that hasn't repaid its debt to the federal government. So now, tax-paying businesses are on the hook. Because in the case of fund insolvency for two consecutive years, as is the case here with California, federal law mandates an automatic increase in payroll taxes that amounts to $21 per employee. The tax continues to ratchet up by $21 per employee each year the fund remains insolvent, with a maximum tax increase of $434 per employee per year. Now, one might ask, why did California not repay its debt to the federal government last year when it had a $97.5 billion surplus? And there's no good answer to that question. I've actually joined with Representative Obernolte to call on California's governor and the legislature time's to repay the loan so the burden doesn't fall on employers. And I'm calling on the United States Senate Gentleman, to consider this a expired. case study in what we don't want for our country. Thank you, and I yield back.
Mr. Kiley is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In recent years, we have seen a movement to fundamentally change America's approach to law and order by defunding police departments and by putting so-called progressive prosecutors in district attorney's offices. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, you are the head of the uh, New York Detectives Endowment Association. Uh, what connection do you see between these two things, defund the police and progressive prosecutors? Well, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're following uh, the progressive line and not backing the police, not uh, caring about the victims, and uh, putting the criminal element back out onto the street to victimize the people of, uh, of this uh, city and state and country. That's right. Both seek to eliminate or neutralize uh, the capabilities of law enforcement, correct? Uh, well, it's, it's been compromised already. That's right. And thereby removing or reducing the consequences of criminal activity, correct? Mm, correct. So these policies have uh, gained a major foothold in several cities, including uh, the one that we're in right now. So we can assess what the impact has been. And one way to assess that impact, of course, is looking at the effect on crime rates. Uh, now, Mr. Holden, you're an elected uh, city council member uh, in New York, a uh, member of the Democratic uh, Party, and uh, you testified today about failed progressive policies. So just to be clear, when you say these are failed progressive policies, uh, is that because they've caused crime to go up or to go down? Uh, again, uh, I'm a critic of, of my party's stance on, on crime. It, everything's gone up. All their policies have led to an increase in crime. And, and I think we saw it come to a head with um, the war on police that, that started after George Floyd, and it went national. And so you saw this kind of crime wave go throughout the entire country. That's right. And in fact, if you look at uh, yesterday's New York Times, uh, it reported that major crime in New York this year is 45 percent up from two years ago. This is from the New York Times. And to your point, in Los Angeles, violent crime is 86 percent higher than the national average. In San Francisco, overall crime is 111 percent higher than the national average. So you can also then look to assess the impact uh, of these policies uh, how, about how people are responding to them. Uh, would you say, Council uh, Member Holden, that these failed progressive policies have caused more people to move to New York City or to move away from New York City? Certainly away from New York City. I've never seen it this bad. Like I said, I grew up in the, in the 80s and 90s in New York, and I saw horrific crime numbers, but now it's much, much worse because it's all over. The, the, the lawlessness mayhem is all over. And in fact, uh, the state of New York is second in the nation in terms of one-way U-Haul and rentals, people who are leaving. Uh, first place, of course, is California now, uh, three years running. Uh, Los Angeles County, where George Gascon is the district attorney, accounts for half the people leaving California. And San Francisco, its population is declining faster than any major city in U.S. history. Now, a final way we can assess the impact of these policies is by the judgment of voters. Uh, Council Member Holden, would you say that, uh, Mayor, uh, that Mayor Eric Adams uh, made the issue of crime a, success, a plank in his, major plank in his successful campaign for mayor? Well, th that was and, and, and certainly is, but he's not getting much support from his colleagues. Correct. And in Los Angeles, uh, George Gascon has been subject to a vote of no confidence by 36 different city councils within his jurisdiction. And San Francisco voters went so far as to recall their pro progressive prosecutor from office overwhelmingly. Now, this is not a red city. The Trump-Pence ticket got 12 percent in San Francisco, and yet voters overwhelmingly recalled that progressive prosecutor. And so the verdict is very clear that these policies have led to crime skyrocketing, to people fleeing, and they're being rejected by voters. And yet today, on the other side of the table, we have by and large saw members of Congress standing by those policies. And for folks who are watching, and for that matter, the victims and the families who are here today, it must be disheartening. But I'd say it's actually not as bleak as it sounds, that in fact the voices that we have heard today on the other side are not representative. And for proof of that, just look what happened in D.C. after the city council there passed a reckless crime bill. In the House majority, we passed legislation to undo what the D.C. city council had done. President Biden signed with us and signed that bill. Two out of three Democrat senators sided with us and voted for that bill. Do you know how many members of this committee on, in the minority voted for that bill? Just one. Every single other member voted to keep the reckless pro-criminal 
DC crime bill in place. So I would say there's a lot more consensus in this country right now than today's hearing uh, makes out, uh, and that the pendulum is swinging back towards supporting victims, supporting law enforcement, supporting law and order, and I look forward to working with people of good faith on both sides of the aisle to restore sanity to our criminal justice system. Gentlemen's time's expired. California Representative Kylie is standing by. Representative Kylie, you're recognized. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Starting uh, first with just a, a, pr a brief point of clarification, uh, we heard a lot of references on the other side to private charter schools. Uh, Mr. Messer, are charter schools public or private schools? They're public schools. And we also heard the other side say that somehow charters get to pick and choose their students. Is that true? No. What are charter schools required to do when it comes to admission in most cases? There may be others on the panel that can answer better than me, but uh, essentially a public school is required to meet the standards of public schools. And accept all students. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Black, um, you're an opponent of school choice, correct? Not in all forms, but at least in the form of, that we've been discussing thus far, yes. But private choice can, or I should say school choice, as mentioned earlier in the form of magnets, uh, is tremendously successful. And charters with appropriate restrictions could also produce uh, positive benefits that I would support. So I wouldn't say I am all for sure, all but you oppose choice. the use of public funds for private education, private schools. Um, if there are, in most instances, I, I wouldn't say there are no instances in which I would say it was appropriate. Oh, and when, where would you support that? Um, you know, there are students who need residential housing um, situations because of severe physical and mental disabilities that simply cannot be delivered okay. in a regular public education setting, and that seems to me. But to by be and large, you're opposed to the use of public by and funding. large. I would think that it. Uh, by and large, the state constitutions are opposed to it, and I stand sure. in accordance. But you don't with think that. private schools should be abolished or anything like that? No, I do not. So you do support the right of families to send their kids to private school if they can afford it? I support yes. And so the likes of, uh, you know, uh, President Biden, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, Nancy Pelosi, Elizabeth Warren, who have paid large sums of money to send their kids to private school, you support their right to do that? I support an individual's choice to spend their money in whatever way they choose to, so long as it doesn't violate state or federal law. And so uh, you make an interesting argument in your testimony. You say that, uh, that the U.S. Constitution, uh, Article 4, Section 4, uh, says that Congress must guarantee a Republican form of government in the states. And you go on to say that since the nation's founding, the provision of public education has been understood as a central pillar of democracy and a Republican form of government. Uh, Professor Black, did COVID-era school shutdowns violate the Republican government clause of the United States Constitution? Did, could you repeat your did statement? Did COVID-era school shutdowns violate the Republican government clause of the U.S. Constitution? Public schools continue to provide education, so when you say shut down, what, in what respect do you well, mean Well, for example, uh, the Burbio in-person instruction tracker for the 2021 school year uh, has an index of in-person instruction. Now, the vast majority uh, of states were above 50 percent, uh, but the five lowest states below 25 percent were Hawaii, Washington, Maryland, Oregon, and last of all, my uh, home state of California. Uh, would you say that those states violated the Republican government clause of the U.S. Constitution uh, by refusing to offer an in-person instruction to their students when other states were able to do so? I would not say, I would, the premise of the question as I understand it, and maybe I misunderstand it, is that they must provide public education at a particular time, in a particular day, in a particular method. The Republican form of government does require public education, but it does not specify the time of day or the location of which that could occur, and thus times in which one was not in school can be made up at later points. So I think you ask a very complicated question that I'd be happy to have further discussions about, but I think there's a lot of nuances to Do you think premises. it was a mistake for those uh, states to keep their schools closed that long? You keep saying closed. Uh, or failing to offer in-person instruction. I'm not a scientist. I don't think I'm prepared to say at what point we should have had in-person instruction or not. I was ultimately think we would follow the CDC guidelines. Okay. You also note that Florida has received an F when it comes to uh, spending 
rankings. Uh, and, uh, I, and you then go on to note that some schools, uh, some, that several other states received A and B ratings. I looked up one of those uh, at random, Washington, D.C., which received an A rating, and then compared how those uh, two jurisdictions, Florida and D.C., have done when it comes to education outcomes and the National Assessment of Education Progress for students eligible for free or reduced lunch. For fourth grade uh, reading, uh, Florida 61 percent achieved basic, basic level of achievement, uh, and D.C. was 38 percent. Eighth grade reading, uh, it was 62 percent uh, to 49 percent. Uh, so why is it that you care? more about the level of the amount of money that is being spent uh, than the amount that students are learning? I do not care more about the amount that's spent. I, I care about studies that show the amount spent correlates and as to this comparison you make the percentage of students with disabilities uh, low income in the District of Columbia is exponentially greater than it is in the state of Florida. And if I might just add that I did a comparison of students who are eligible for free or reduced lunch. This is an apples to oh, apples sorry. comparison. My apologies. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Cowley, and uh, well, yield back. I'd like to take a, a moment to ask a few questions of the witness. Uh, Director uh, Tettelbach, thank you for your testimony uh, today. Do you believe that the Second Amendment uh, is an important right? I believe all the uh, constitutional rights that we have are important. So you're not one of those people who says we'd be better off without it? Uh, I'm one of those people who says what the law says, what the Constitution says, is what we should do and, and what we have to honor. I understand that, and I'm glad to hear you say that. But uh, as sort of a matter of what's best for society, do you think it's important that our Constitution does have a Second Amendment? I think that all the amendments are important. I, it's very hard to start comparing the right to freedom of religion versus the right. To, they're all important. They're okay, all so important why do you rights. think the Second Amendment is important? Why, why do why, I? Why is it important that we have a second amendment? Well, at the, most, at the most basic notion, because I'm an American, because I follow the Constitution and the, the, the founders, uh, or sure, or sure when they I'm enacted the Bill of Rights, I mean, right. I... It, uh, why is it important, the second amendment, that particular right, why is it important? I mean, I mean it's, it's part of our founding document. It's in the Constitution of the United States, along with all these other uh, rights that are so, very so you're important. you're glad it's there, the second amendment? Sorry? You're glad it's there. You're glad it's part of our Constitution. Uh, it's part of being an American is that that Constitution, when we take an oath in public service, uh, unlike any other country, right, we take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States. That's what we swear to do. It, sure. so, so that's an important oath, and it, that's a very important document. And I'm glad to hear you say that. We have had amendments that have been repealed. You're not someone who says it'd be better if we just repealed the Second Amendment, right? Uh, I, I have never participated in anything like that. And again, but your it opinion, is my job. Your opinion, it is you, my job. be a good or bad thing? It is, it is my job as ATF director uh, to honor the, 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 the constitutional rights and legal statutes passed by Congress, and I do. And I'm very glad to hear you say that. But as an American, uh, do you think that'd be a good or bad thing if the amendment was repealed? Again, I, I don't think as director of ATF, me, me giving my personal opinions on which laws are more or less important is, is, is the right thing to do. But something in the Constitution is, of course, very important. Okay, so you don't want to say right now, affirm that you believe it's good that we have a Second Amendment? I, I, I don't want to... I don't think it's appropriate to give my personal opinion on any of the particular amendments. They're in the Constitution. All right. They Thank are the much. highest law of the land. So you also uh, testified in your written testimony uh, that we have more than 100 people who die from firearms violence across the country every day, and you say that most of these tragedies uh, never make the news. Are you aware of a, uh, and I think we can all agree that this is uh, you know, an unspeakable tragedy for every family. Are you aware of a study from 2017 by the University of Chicago sh that showed that the average murder or shooting suspect had approximately 12 prior arrests in their criminal record? I'm not aware of that particular study, but I, I'm not aware of that particular study, no, sir. Does it sound wrong to you or does it sound plausible? Uh, I think, as I said before, it, there's this many people who do crimes and then trigger pullers are a much smaller percentage, and they tend to repeat sure. uh, crimes. And identifying those for state and local law enforcement is very important. Absolutely. So we can focus our resources on the shooters, right? Sure, exactly. And the D.C. Uh, police chief has said that it's on average 11 uh, prior arrests for uh, homicide suspects. In this jurisdiction, this is Robert Conti, chief of police in D.C., uh, he said that what we've got to do if we really want to see homicides go down is keep bad guys with guns in jail. When they're in jail, they can't be in communities shooting people. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, we work very closely with D.C. police. When their lab was decertified, okay, I'm not asking took over the gun lab. Down. I'm asking, do you agree with that statement from the chief of police? When they're in jail, they can't be in communities shooting people. Uh, uh, 
dangerous people who commit violent crimes should be incarcerated. All right, thank you. We've heard a lot of statements from the other side of the dais today, uh, sort of in very high tones, uh, speaking about the lack of uh, efforts to, uh, to deal with gun violence and a lot of very partisan attacks. But as you might be aware, uh, Congress recently actually acted uh, for, uh, to prevent uh, violent crime in Washington, D.C by repealing a measure that would have lowered penalties for crime across the board that the District of Columbia uh, had enacted. Now that measure uh, was signed into law by President Biden, uh, as you may know. Uh, 81 members of the U.S. Senate voted for it, 81 to 14. And yet every single person on the other side today who has spoken up saying uh, that we need to do more about gun violence voted against that measure. Does that strike you as a hypocritical, Director? Um. Sitting here today, there are obviously very passionate views on all sides, as I said, in the middle here. Sure. Um, and it's, it's not my role to engage in, in that kind of role. I run a law enforcement agency, and the decisions that Congress makes on policy are things that we then take and try to implement in the but, but your testimony talked at great length about gun violence, and you've just recognized that much of it stems from repeat offenders. So isn't it a good thing that we managed to at least make it so we don't have as many repeat offenders in this district? Uh, again, I, I don't run law enforcement in the district. They're partners of ours. We work closely with them. Um, and, and I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a member of this body. I leave it to members of these bodies to make those policy decisions. Then we take the results and try to protect people with them. Uh, thank you. Ms. Bish is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Owens, uh, for uh, those uh, very on-point remarks. Uh, you said it very well uh, that this nominee is anti-business and anti-growth uh, and anti-worker as well. And I think it's important for us to have a sense of perspective here, uh, that this is such a vital moment, uh, a moment of vital importance for the American workforce. We're coming out of, an, uh, out of an era of unprecedented upheaval and we're heading towards an era of, in many ways, unpredictable transformation. So for the top labor position in America, we need a secretary who is competent and qualified, who is pro-worker and pro-small business, who will work with Democrats and Republicans alike, who is fair, and who understands what has made the American workforce the greatest engine for human progress the world has ever known. Simply put, Julie Sue is not that person. Her record in California makes that all too clear. Indeed, during the pandemic, Julie Su and her, un her employment development department, known as the EDD, became the national poster child for government failure. I saw this firsthand as a state representative. Millions of Californians had their legitimate unemployment claims wrongfully withheld for weeks, months, or sometimes indefinitely under Sue's mismanagement. And you don't need to take my word for that. In July of 2020, 61 of the 80 members of the California Assembly, mostly Democrats, wrote the following. In our fifth month of the pandemic, with so many constituents yet to receive a single unemployment payment, it's clear that EDD is failing California. Millions of our constituents have had no income for months. As Californians wait for answers from EDD, they have depleted their life savings, have gone into extreme debt, and are in deep panic as they figure out how to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. The lawmakers went on to explain how the EDD, under Sue's management, time and again failed to take responsibility and failed to correct its mistakes. They wrote that they had been met with long-winded excuses, fumbling non-answers, or unclear and inconsistent data, along with a lack of transparency and accountability, even, they said, obfuscation and dishonesty in their dealings with Sue's agency. We have exhausted all avenues at our disposal, they said, as the agency had addressed only a few of the many issues we have highlighted for months and was only, quote, scratching the surface of the disaster that is EDD, the disaster. That's how the California Democrat supermajority characterized Julie Sue's agency. The frustrated legislators lamented how little has improved at EDD over the course of the pandemic. Independent reports confirmed the extent of mismanagement and deception from Sue's agency. Well, the EDD had said in July of 2020 that its claims backlog would be cleared by September, a report found 1.5 million claims remained unresolved and the backlog was increasing by 10,000 each week. The independent 
Legislative Analyst's Office likewise found the EDD mischaracterized the crisis. Even allies of the governor and Secretary Sue concluded that she was responsible for this. Democrat Assembly Member Cotty Petrie Norris, who is chairwoman of the Assembly Accountability and Administrative Review Committee responsible for overseeing the EDD, said that Sue, quote, has not done a good job at running the Unemployment Development Department, saying Sue's mismanagement, quote, caused heartache for millions of Californians. That is the top Democrat on the committee that oversaw her work in California saying she did not do a good job at running the Employment Development Department. What reason is there to think she's going to be a, do a good job then running the U.S. Labor Department? But it gets much worse. As so many hardworking citizens waited in vain for their checks in California after they were told they weren't allowed to work during the COVID shutdowns, as these folks who were entitled to their checks waited for them, one group seemed to have no trouble at all getting benefits, and that was people who were not entitled to them, who perpetrated a massive fraud against the state government of California. In fact, it was the largest fraud of taxpayer dollars in history. An estimated $32 billion was wrongfully paid out from the EDD to state prison inmates, international crime syndicates, and other criminals. Payments were made to murderers, rapists, child molesters. 133 death row inmates received over $400,000 alone. These hardened criminals didn't have to try hard. They used names like Diane Feinstein and John Doe. The district attorney of Sacramento County called the scheme, quote, relatively easy. And the individual most responsible, once again, was Secretary Julie Hsu. She made the inexplicable decision to forego a basic fraud detection prevention system. She ignored the federal government's guidance that claims be cross-checked against the prison rolls, which was standard practice in other states. The agency sent hundreds of benefit cards to the same address, sent cards directly to correct correctional facilities, issued benefits to infants and centenarians. A January 2021 report from the California State Auditor notes that the EDD fraud occurred for three main reasons. First, EDD waited about four months to automate a key anti-fraud measure. Second, EDD allowed claimants to collect benefits even though they were using suspicious addresses. And third, EDD removed a key safeguard against improper payments without fully understanding the significance of the safeguard. But perhaps worst of all is that Julie Sue has refused to accept responsibility. Just last week at her Senate confirmation hearing, she said, that uh, as soon as we knew there was fraud happening, I shut the front door to that fraud. That's her testimony just last week. As soon as we knew there was fraud happening, I shut the front door to that fraud. And yet, California's independent state auditor has found that, quote, despite repeated warnings, EDD did not bolster its fraud detection efforts until months into the pandemic. There is no predicting what will happen to our country to our workforce if that level of mismanagement is brought to the U.S. Department of Labor. And I'd like to uh, discuss one more facet of uh, Ms. Sue's tenure in California. Madam Speaker, I rise today to address uh, a situation surrounding uh, the senior senator from California, Dianne Feinstein. The latest news is that our governor, Gavin Newsom, is now talking about appointing Oprah to the U.S. Senate uh, as a replacement. Now, Gavin Newsom has been talking about replacing Senator Feinstein for over two years. He started publicly speculating about this in 2021, about who he would replace. And at that point, uh, Senator Feinstein was barely a third of the way through her term. California's other senator, Alex Padilla, was himself first uh, got his office through appointment uh, by Governor Newsom. So if there was, in fact, an appointment of Senator Feinstein, then both of our U.S. senators would have been handpicked, uh, not by millions of voters, but by a single person to initially get their jobs. At this moment, pressure is coming from all directions uh, when it comes to this situation and with a race uh, for 2024 already uh, underway. A number of sitting members of the House have actually overtly called on Senator Feinstein to resign. 
Uh, Ro Khanna said, it's time for Senator Feinstein to resign. We need to put the country ahead of personal loyalty. Well, she has had a lifetime of public service. It is obvious she can no longer fulfill her duties. Not speaking out undermines our credibility as elected representatives of the people. That's what he said. You also had uh, Congresswoman Talib, um, as well as Congresswoman Kamala Gurdav, uh, make similar comments urging the senator uh, to vacate her office. And uh, the individual who's being supported by uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Khanna, uh, Barbara Lee, has said she told KQED that she would accept an appointment uh, to the job if Governor Gavin Newsom offered it to her. Meanwhile, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who of course herself is from California, uh, is supporting uh, another candidate, uh, Congressman Schiff, uh, and uh, there have been a number of recent uh, headlines uh, related to this. Uh, this comes from Politico, uh, which says that Feinstein's primary caregiver is Pelosi's daughter. The subheadline says a quiet caretaking arrangement has raised questions about whether Nancy Pelosi has the ailing senator's personal interests at heart. Uh, another headline uh, from Washington Examiner, Pelosi's secret campaign to aid Feinstein and get Schiff into the Senate. Uh, from Fox News, Pelosi's office denies her daughter is aiding Feinstein to help Adam Schiff win a Senate seat. So this is just a mess. None of it right now is about what is in the interest of Senator Feinstein, the interest of our state, or the interest of our country. It is all about politics. And so I believe the solution is to do away with the possibility of a gubernatorial appointment altogether. That way, Senator Feinstein can make a decision on her own terms. She will know that whether she finishes her term or whether she steps down before the end of her term, it is California voters who will decide who her successor will be. That is what will allow her to make a decision without all of the distractions of politics at the moment. To that end, I have introduced a constitutional amendment, doing away with appointed senators. Now, this would make it so the Senate is the same as the House. You don't have any appointed members of the House who step onto this floor. Yet you've had a lot of appointed senators. So I want to make it the same way that if you want to represent your state as a United States senator, you need to be elected to do so. Indeed, this is really an anachronism, uh, this process of appointing senators in the case of a vacancy. And it's been subject to rampant abuse. Uh, we had a governor, Rod Vavoyevich, go to prison after he essentially auctioned off uh, Barack Obama's vacated Senate seat. We've had governors who have appointed family members, who have appointed their spouses. Several governors uh, have even appointed themselves. So I am calling on uh, members of the House and Senate to join me in passing that to do away with this anachronistic, anti-democratic uh, process of appointing senators. But in the meantime, this uh, almost certainly will not take effect uh, prior to the current situation with Senator Feinstein being resolved. So I am calling on the state legislature in California which has oversight over election laws and uh, itself uh, is responsible for creating the procedure for a gubernatorial appointment uh, to address the situation. And there's actually a little bit of a backstory here because uh, when Senator, Fi uh, Senator Padilla uh, was appointed to the Senate following uh, the election of Kamala Harris as vice president, uh, I raised an issue at the time with the legality of that appointment. And actually, the state uh, legislative uh, analyst office, uh, or legislative counsel's office, in California agreed with me that it would not be constitutional for the governor to appoint a senator who would then serve out the remainder of Kamala Harris's term, uh, which was uh, set to expire uh, in 2022. Um, and the reason for that is that the Constitution, the 17th Amendment, only allows temporary appointments. So if you appoint someone who serves the rest of the term, that's not temporary, that's permanent. So what the legislature did in response to the, uh, the legal issue I raised and that the Legislative Council's office agreed with me on, is they passed a bill to say that, okay, we will have a special election uh, to determine uh, who the new senator is going to be and who's going to finish the term, but we're not going to have that special election until the next election. So that actually happened uh, in November of 2022. At the exact same time, we held the election for who would serve the new six-year term. 
it was an absurdity. We literally had a, the same election on the ballot twice. One was for the new six-year term. Uh, the other was just for the last couple months, the lame duck portion of the existing term. That was the way our legislature uh, figured out to allow, to give basically as much advantage to the governor's chosen appointed senator as possible, while still abiding by the letter, if not the spirit, of the 17th Amendment. So what I've been uh, in conversations with some members of the legislature about is they should change this law, or at the very least, making an exception to it uh, for uh, the, uh, the current situation with Senator Feinstein to say that if there is a vacancy, then there will not be an appointment, that there will be an immediate special election, uh, and uh, that is how the successor will be chosen uh, for the remainder of Senator Feinstein's term, which is set to expire in 2024. I think that this is what it will allow for uh, fairness uh, in the process of uh, choosing our next senator. It will give millions of Californians a say uh, rather than just one individual. And it will give uh, Senator Feinstein uh, the ability to make a decision that is best for her, best for the state, and best for the country. And so I urge that action on the part of the California legislature and governor. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, we just heard a lot of speeches uh, at a very high volume uh, on the topic of the debt ceiling, and uh, many of them had a, a com an accompanying visual uh, that said, House Republicans are forcing a default uh, on our debt. Uh, now, that's a very strange statement, given that the House has already passed a bill to stop us from defaulting on our debt. Weeks ago, the House passed a bill to raise the debt ceiling. I'll say that again, the House has passed a bill to raise the debt ceiling that protects Social Security, protects Medicare, protects our veterans, and puts us on the more fiscally sustainable path that Americans are demanding. Now that bill is sitting in the Senate right now. The Senate could pass it at any time. But of course, the Senate isn't even here this week, so they haven't done so. As we speak, Speaker McCarthy and President Biden are negotiating. This is precisely what the overwhelming majority of Americans, Democrats, Republicans, independents, say that they want. A bipartisan solution that raises the debt ceiling while making responsible reforms to spending. The speeches that we just heard are advocating precisely the opposite. They want to pull the rug out from under this ongoing negotiation, bring it to a stop, impose a one-sided, partisan solution that allows us to keep spending money without limit. Indeed, I was particularly struck by a comment from the Congresswoman uh, from New York, who in defense of this idea that we should keep spending money uh, without limit, said this, said, if anyone wants to entertain the thought that we spend too much, think about the last time that someone said the government does too much. Those are her words. She said, think about the last time anyone said the government does too much. Well, actually, my constituents say that a lot. The government does too much when it overtaxes and overregulates Americans. The government certainly did too much when it shut down schools, shut down businesses, shut down churches, and imposed unlawful mandates. The government does too much when it pays people more to not work than to work. The government did too much when it went in a multi-trillion dollar spending spree that even Barack Obama's top economic advisor warned against and gave us this historic inflation crisis. The government does too much when it unleashes 87,000 new IRS agents on unsuspecting American taxpayers. The government does too much when it shuts down the Keystone Pipeline and inhibits our ability to produce energy domestically and make us energy independent. But at the end of the day, we also need to ask, as we've seen the budget just grow and grow and grow without limit, what is the result of all that additional spending been? Do you look around and see beautiful roads and infrastructure? Do you see world-leading schools? Do you see a prosperous economy? No, of course not. So I do think that as we make reforms to spending, we also need to focus on waste, fraud, and abuse. We need to focus not just on how much money is being spent, but on how that money is being spent. Not just on the number of dollars that we're spending, but on the results that we are getting. And I'm hoping that that is the new paradigm that will emerge 
from the negotiations going on right now between President Biden and Speaker McCarthy is a paradigm of customer service, citizen service, a performance-based government. That's what Americans deserve, and I encourage the President to negotiate uh, in good faith with Speaker McCarthy to move us in that direction. Madam Speaker, I rise today to discuss the latest disturbing revel revelations relating to President Biden's nominee for U.S. Secretary of Labor, Julie Su. The nomination remains stalled, and for good reason. Ms. Su's record of gross mismanagement, historic unmatched mismanagement, has, as California's Labor Secretary under Governor Gavin Newsom, is now well understood. For example, during Ms. Su's tenure, $32.6 billion in taxpayer funds were fraudulently paid to death row inmates, international criminal syndicates, and other fraudsters. This fraud was possible because Sue waived fraud prevention protections, actually removed guardrails despite repeated warnings, and she failed to follow the common sense practices of other states, and then failed to take corrective actions as billions were lost to fraud. At the same time that this fraud was occurring, by the way, Sue improperly denied or delayed for weeks, months, sometimes indefinitely, legitimate unemployment claims for millions of Americans. Madam Speaker, I've now spoken on this floor several times to make sure that Americans are aware of that track record and understand the risk that elevating Ms. Sue poses. It is a reasonable inference that a nominee who failed in her role as State Labor Secretary would likewise fail in the role as U.S. Labor Secretary and certainly has failed to earn such a promotion. Well, now that is no longer merely an inference. It is the reality, because as her nomination has stalled, Ms. Sue has all the while been serving as the acting secretary at the Department of Labor. And unsurprisingly, she has brought her record of mismanagement from California to the Department of Labor as acting secretary, with terrible consequences. A recent report from the New York Times has uncovered evidence of a major spike in unaccompanied migrant minors, children, being funneled to work in dangerous jobs in violation of federal labor law. The article is titled, As Migrant Children Were Put to Work, U.S. Ignored Warnings. The Times reports the White House and federal agencies were repeatedly alerted to signs of children at risk. The warnings were ignored or missed. To take one example from the Times article, a boy working construction said he felt ashamed about not knowing how to read. He too was released in 2021 at age 12 and was immediately put to work by a man who had sponsored at least five children. In another case, at a day labor pickup site, a 13-year-old released last year to a man he had never met said he wished he could enroll in middle school and start learning English. The problem is much broader than a handful of cases. Signs of migrant child labor have been uncovered inside industrial workplaces, including several auto part factories. Additionally, over 100 children were found working the overnight shift, scouring meat packing, meat packing plants across the country, according to the Times. Now, I should note, monitoring workplaces to prevent child labor is the job of the Labor Department. Julie Su was Deputy Labor Secretary and is now Acting Labor Secretary. As the, and she held those roles as children were exploited to work in grueling conditions in violation of federal labor law. This pattern of conduct almost exactly mirrors Sue's tenure in California. Repeated warnings of a serious problem, little to no preventative action, followed by a refusal to accept responsibility or change course when her failures are brought to light. And unfortunately, this isn't the only major concern that has emerged during Julie Sue's short time as acting U.S. Secretary of Labor. At the same time that children have been exploited in workplaces, Ms. Sue has failed to properly manage the H-2A program for bringing in temporary agricultural workers on a legal basis. Just this morning, House Education and the Workforce Chairwoman Virginia Fox and I sent an oversight letter to Acting Secretary Sue regarding serious delays in the processing of H-2A applications. In the letter, we write, it has come to the, committee, the attention of the Committee on Education and the Workforce that employers applying for labor certifications at the Department of Labor for H-2A agricultural workers are facing substantial delays. 
These delays can be tremendously harmful for American agriculture. The arrival of workers can be delayed by weeks, causing inefficiencies and supply chain disruptions. The planting and harvesting windows offer only a short amount of time to meet the season's needs. Our understanding is that this worsening problem is caused by unnecessary and avoidable delays at the Department of Labor. Incredibly, a Department of Labor official, Mike Rios, who serves as Regional Agricultural Enforcement Director at the Wage and Hour Division, is quoted as saying this. He said, you can see that the H-2A program literally is the purchase of human beings, is literally the purchase of humans to perform difficult work under terrible conditions, sometimes including subhuman living conditions. This is a bipartisan program that has been created and has existed for a long time. He says that, but that's what he had to say about it. He's also quoted as saying, you can throw a rock and hit a violation in the agricultural industry. That is a strange thing for him to say, considering that it is his department and uh, Julie Sue's department, the Department of Labor, that is responsible for preventing those sort of violations, for enforcing our labor laws. So under Julie Sue's leadership, the Department of Labor is failing to protect workers, including children, is unfairly attacking America's farmers, and is failing to support our agriculture sector's workforce needs under a program authorized by federal law. She has been acting secretary for only a matter of months and was deputy secretary for two years. In that time, she has directly transferred her record of mismanagement from California to the rest of the nation. And I should say, in California right now, we have the nation's largest budget deficit. We have the nation's second highest unemployment rate. We have the nation's lowest rate of income growth. We have the highest rate of poverty. This is the direct result of the mismanagement and the anti-worker, anti-business, anti-opportunity policies from the likes of Julie Su and Gavin Newsom. With everything we now know, to elevate Ms. Su would be to take our country down the failed path of California with eyes wide open. I urge President Biden to choose a different course. It is past time to withdraw this nomination. Madam Speaker, I rise today to support the Halt All Lethal Trafficking of Fentanyl Act, which uh, passed the House of Representatives earlier today. This bill fixes a critical loophole and empowers law enforcement to continue to have the tools they need to prevent fentanyl distribution in communities across America. We are seeing staggering amounts of fentanyl pour across the southern border flooding our communities with illicit and lethal pills, killing tens of thousands of Americans every year. This is now the leading cause of death for young people in our country. More than car accidents, more than suicides, more than anything. It is affecting every community in our country, including my own. During the State of the Union a few months ago, I was honored to have as my guests two of our nation's leading advocates for fentanyl awareness, the parents of a young man named Zag Didier who tragically lost his life to fentanyl. He was a senior at Whitney High School, a standout student with no history of drug use, and from one pill, he tragically lost his life. His parents had to go through the gut-wrenching experience of seeing him get letters in the mail, accepting him to some of our nation's leading universities after he had passed away. There is simply no doubt that addressing the fentanyl crisis will save the lives of many of my constituents and of people in every community in our country. And this act, the Halt All Lethal Trafficking of Fentanyl Act, is a major step in that direction. In fact, the act itself is common sense. Fentanyl is currently classified as a Schedule I drug, which gives the Drug Enforcement Agency the power to enforce and arrest criminals involved in producing and distributing fentanyl. To avoid prosecution, criminals have begun to manufacture drugs nearly chemically identical to fentanyl. Now, these drugs are just as deadly. They mimic fentanyl in every way, but they don't fall under the technical definition of fentanyl. In response, the Department of Justice and DEA temporarily classified these fentanyl-related substances as Schedule I drugs. This common sense act makes this temporary classi classification permanent rather than letting it expire. Giving law enforcement the tools they need to prosecute those responsible and involved in the fentanyl crisis from producers to dealers is a critical component of the multi-pronged approach needed to save lives and stop fentanyl from destroying our communities. And we know this approach works. 
After the DEA classified fentanyl-related substances as Schedule I drugs, law enforcement encounters of these fentanyl copycat drugs fell by over 90%. I urge my colleagues in the Senate to support a proven measure that will save lives and to vote aye on the Halt All Lethal Trafficking of Fentanyl Act, which just passed the House today with bipartisan support and has the support of President Biden as well. Uh, good morning, uh, Acting over here, <laughs> Acting Secretary Sue. Uh, good to have you here. Um, just to make sure I have your background correct, you were the uh, Secretary of the Labor and Workforce Development Agency in California uh, from 2019 to 2021? Correct. And you were the California Labor Commissioner from 2011 to 2018? Correct. So in your uh, Senate testimony uh, in April, uh, you touted President Biden's economic record. Uh, you said the results speak for themselves. And you specifically cited the unemployment rate. You said it's been less than 4% for more than a year, which is close to the lowest it's been uh, in 50 years. Do you happen to know how your home state of California is doing when it comes to the unemployment rate there versus other states? Thank you very much, Congressman. I don't know what the current unemployment rate in California is. So um, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, California currently has the second highest unemployment rate in the nation. Does that sound right? I don't know. I trust that that you have that correct. So if a low unemployment rate, by your own testimony, is a sign of good economic stewardship, what does it tell us about California that it has the nation's second highest unemployment rate? So thank you very much for that question, uh, Congressman. You are correct um, that we share a home state and that I was the labor secretary for, um, uh, from 2019 to 2021, and prior to that, the labor commissioner, where my job was to enforce wage and hour laws uh, in, 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 in work. Right, we've established that. So the question about the unemployment rate, which, by the way, was similar during your tenure, 2020, 2021, California was first, second, or third highest unemployment rate in the country. So you yourself have said at a low unemployment rate says we're doing a good job. What does it mean that California has a high unemployment rate? I think, Congressman, we would likely agree that there are lots of measures of what makes a strong economy, um, and there's lots of ways to look at, uh, you know, obviously the, it, mm -hmm. it makes sense for, um, for, for us to try to address high unemployment because having people um, who are looking for jobs be able to do jobs and having people who are in jobs be able to upskill and, and get to better jobs is, sure. is a goal that I, I know we share, so but I don't think it's... Let's talk about a couple other measures. Measure. You said in your testimony in April, too many people still work full-time year-round and live in poverty. Uh, according to the latest Census Bureau data, the supplemental poverty measure, do you happen to know which state has the highest real poverty rate in the country? I don't know that, sir. It actually happens to be California. And you happen to know, according to a recent report from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, where California ranks when it came to net earnings growth this last year? I don't know that off the top of my head. California was 50th out of 50. So if our goals are to reduce unemployment, reduce poverty, and to increase wages, is California really the best model, given that it is the absolute worst in the country of the 50 states by all of these measures? Again, Congressman, I, I think that there are lots of measures for, um, for, for how well an economy is doing. Um, my understanding, and I haven't worked in California now for two years, but is that um, by some measures, including recovery from the pandemic, including um, uh, decrease in poverty over the last few years, you know, recovering since the pandemic, um, that California has uh, has. Okay, I just want to exceeded. reiterate, though, these were the very measures that you yourself cited in your own testimony. In your state of California, where you led the Labor Department, is doing the worst in the country. Uh, so let's move on to, uh, to AB5, uh, which is a law that you were charged with enforcing uh, in California. Were you involved, now I know you weren't in the legislature, but were you involved in the drafting of AB5, including any conversations with the author or the interest groups that helped draft it? Um, thank you, Congressman. As I think it has been established, and as you know, I was um, never part of the California legislature. Right, as I just My, said. But were you yeah. involved in any way in the drafting of AB5? I did not draft AB5. I were did you not. involved in any way in the drafting of it? No, sir. Did you support the law? Well, my job as Labor Secretary was to enforce the laws that were passed by the legislature. It's the same role I, I have I understand that, but here. did you ever express support for AB5? I expressed the need to enforce laws that are passed by the legislature, and that is the sure, same thing that we've was, done. My question was, did you express support specifically for AB5 at any time? I may have, sir. I know we're talking a lot about what I did um, in California. You I may think. have. Do you think it was a good law, AB5? 
Do I think AB5 was a good law? Um, I think that um, it is m m both my job uh, now as the Acting Secretary of Labor um, and the job of, uh, that I had in California as the Labor Secretary mm -hmm. and the Labor Commissioner to enforce laws that are passed uh, Right, but that's not what I asked. What I asked was, do you think AB5 is a good law? I don't know what, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I, tell me what, give me a little bit more about what you mean by that. Do you think it was a good law for the state? Is it good that it passed? I think that, you know, when AB5 was first signed, one of the things that I, I did in my role as, uh, as Labor Secretary in California was create a port, we reached out to employers and worked with My, my time here is running out. I just want to give you one last chance, uh, Acting Secretary Sue. Is AB5 a good law, yes or no? I think it's an important role of the government to help employers to comply with laws yes that are no. passed by the legislature. Is AB 5 a good law? But also it's important to enforce I, laws that are passed. I know that Mr. Mr. Kiley, that you're going to get the witness to answer truthfully. Uh, I now uh, recognize Mr. Dean. Uh, so we've heard uh, some comments from uh, the other side as well as from the witness herself to the effect of what does California's uh, AB 5 have to do with any of this. Uh, but President Biden uh, has himself said, and this is a quote, that he wants a federal standard modeled on California's ABC test for all labor, employment, and tax laws. Uh, so, Ms. Sue, you're the acting Secretary of Labor. You're President Biden's uh, chosen nominee to be Secretary of Labor. I think it's fair to ask, do you agree or disagree with the president that AB5 is a good model for the nation? Congressman, thank you. Let me be as clear as I can be about this. Um, AB5 is not federal law. Um, it would only be federal law if Congress decides that it should be. Um, I have not called for that on the federal level. In fact, I have explicitly, during my tenure as Deputy Secretary of Labor, when we um, created the um, proposed rule about independent contractor, um, explicitly said that we do not adopt an ABC test, and in fact, we cannot adopt sure, an ABC test. Sure, and I understand that. Uh, however, there's uh, quite a bit of leeway in that rule, and uh, it says that the, and it's clearly designed to mimic the ABC test in many respects, so the disposition of the enforcer is centrally important to our oversight role as Congress. So I didn't get an answer. I'd like just an answer, yes or no, agree, disagree, with the President's statement that the ABC test of California's AB5 is a good model for the nation, yes or no? I just, I mean, I have to say again, because um, the, the, the question seems to ignore that I, I we can't, it's, it's, it is strictly in the purview of Congress mm -hmm. to decide whether AB, AB5, the okay. ABC test, right, would become the test for independent contractor S versus sure. employee status so, so on the federal level. Earlier you were saying, you, you said that you, uh, you might have expressed support for AB5 before. Just to refresh your recollection, uh, shortly after it was signed, you went on the record with Cal Matters and said not only were you going to be adjudicating claims that came to you, but you said we will be doing investigations and audits so that those who want to comply with the need to reclassify can do so, and those who don't will understand, these are your words, that's not the kind of economy we want in California. You celebrated its passage. Now, will you at least recognize, uh, Acting Secretary Sue, that people in California have lost their careers, their livelihoods, their ability to work because of AB5? So, Congressman, I want to also say that I have heard from people who have said that, and I think that that's, it's important to acknowledge them. I've had direct conversations with them as recently as, I don't know, a few weeks ago, where we don't want, I don't want ever our policies to result in people losing their livelihoods or right, having to so did AB5 yeah. do that? Did it cause people to lose their livelihoods? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that I've heard people who said that. I've heard people who said something different, too. I think the, the important point is You've heard point, people even, say that they lost their livelihoods because of AB5. I have had people tell me that. And so do you me, not believe them? Or well, could you but, say they said it? I guess, Congressman, you know, even to the quote that you just read, um, it feels like that quote is exactly what, in my role as the enforcer of laws, mm -hmm. I would say, which is that we are going to enforce the law as it is written, and um, we want to make sure that we have a, you know, I mean, a, 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 an economy in which um, people, uh, everybody plays by the rules. So this is, a, this is a book of stories shortly after the law passed from people who said, as you would put it, uh, that they lost their livelihoods because of AB5. Couple examples. Jody said, I worked years to gain my skills in American Sign Language Interpreter. It was my goal since I was nine years old. After AB5, I lost all three of my agencies. The dream I worked for is lost. I can't provide my family, and thousands of California deaf won't be serviced. Is your message to Jody that that's just not the kind of economy that we want in California? 
Uh, my message to her would be that um, bona fide independent contractors will always have a place in our economy. Uh, they play but an important role. But not her. Role. She's not a bona fide independent contractor. I haven't had a conversation with her, but I do. I would. I would. I, I do think that it's very important to reiterate that um, the policies in at, at the United States are the policies that um, at the at the federal level are the policies that would be within the purview of the Labor well, Department. While you were California enforce, Labor Secretary, did you meet with any of the folks who lost their livelihoods from AB five? I did. I heard from many people on all sides about. The impact, the, the impact of AB5 okay. after it was passed. And as I said earlier, I spent a lot of time talking to employers about how implementation could support them, right? Sometimes That's people good. had an idea about what it would do. And as you know, uh, California voters have also weighed in uh, with Prop 22, which said we don't want AB5 to apply to app based drivers. How did you vote on that on Prop 22? How did I vote on Prop 22? I don't remember how I voted on that. You don't remember? On I Prop 22, the one applying the one, to Uber, Lyft, DoorDash drivers, saying that AB5 isn't going to apply to them. You don't remember how you voted? Right. I, I mean, I, I think... Well, so you can, I'll give you a second to think about it. Do you remember how you voted on Prop 22? Congressman, I, I, want to, I want to say very clearly here that I pledge, and I think my record demonstrates, absolute fidelity to the laws as passed by this body, as interpreted by the courts, and as delegated I, to I the Department of that, Labor I appreciate that, but now you've had a second to think. Do you remember Ms. how you voted Mr. on Prop 22? Kiley. And Mr. Bean, your time is up. Mr. Bowman. Well, now that we have that commitment, uh, maybe I'll try again. <laughs> Did you vote for Prop 22 in California? Yes or no? Congressman, I am sitting here before you today <laughs> to talk about the Department of Labor and our work at the Department of Labor. You're asking me about a vote I took in a, you know, in, in, in a at, at a time where we. You know, we have secret ballot votes in this country. I'm not trying to say that that I, you know, like okay. one way or the other. I'm just saying we are here to talk about Dharma. I offered a little while ago to say I am happy and eager to work with you on the many issues that you raise that you're saying Californians continue to face. Well, uh, excuse me, are... Acting Secretary Sue, okay. this is an oversight hearing, so I think we okay. can judge what issues are relevant to our oversight function. And you just committed to my colleague that you'd give yes or no answers, then you refused. The clearest yes or no question that you could possibly uh, give an answer to. So do you want to try one more time? Wait, Congressman, I just, I really am not trying Mr. to avoid Chairman, it. Mr. Chairman, point of order. I, you've, you've asked that question All right, at least I'll move on. Two, I, let's go on times. to the... Uh, I also just want to clarify, because I am a person of my word. I did not say you would always get yes or no questions. What I said explicitly about that is that not every question is a yes or no question. I am going to give you the most accurate answers that okay, I can. I've I appreciate been endeavoring that. to do that for as long as we've been sitting so here. So let's go back to, the, to uh, the issue of the joint employer rule. Uh, you said okay. it's not on your agenda right now, right? That is correct. And so are you not planning on doing any changes to the joint employer rule during your tenure as Secretary of Labor? I pledge to follow all of the rules of the Department of Labor, of this body, of oversight. We will not do a rule that, we, that, that, we, that we're not clear, uh, that we haven't followed the rules to do. I said at the very beginning, we are deliberative when it comes to rulemaking. We engage stakeholders. Okay, I didn't sure ask about engagement with stakeholders or anything like what? that. What I asked was, are you planning to do any changes to the joint employer rule, yes or no? We do not have a plan to do that. It is not on our agenda. You, can you commit to not making any changes to the joint employer rule as Secretary of Labor? Well, what I, this is why what I'm saying is that is that I commit to following all of the rules of rulemaking, mm -hmm. everything that we're required to do. I pledge to you that we will do under my leadership, under my tenure at the Department of Labor. I can't sit here at this moment and tell you with certainty everything that's going sure. to happen, but okay. I will follow you every You were also asked uh, by uh, Mr. Banks about uh, the child labor crisis that we're seeing. And at your confirmation hearing, uh, Senator Romney brought this up as well, a 70% increase. And he asked you, was that communicated to the White House prior to this year? Is that something you've communicated to them? This is a major, major problem. And your answer was, I don't know the answer to that question. You said you didn't know whether that had been communicated to the White House, what a problem this child labor crisis was. Uh, do you remember now whether you communicated that to the White House prior to this year? Did you say prior to this year? Correct. I don't know. I don't know that. I, I, I will say that we have, um, there is an interagency task force that the White House um, put together and put the Department of Labor in charge of. We, I am proud to play that role. It's a really important role. We are in conversations about how to address the scourge of exploitative child labor in this country. Thank you. It just seems to be like something very important that you might have wanted to let the White House know about. Um, Mr. We're almost done. 
Acting Secretary Sue, do you accept any, uh, any responsibility uh, for the $32 billion in unemployment fraud that occurred on your watch in California? Thank you very much for that, Congressman. I certainly know that I and many of my colleagues and others who sat in the same position that I did um, during when the pandemic hit um, uh, wish that we had had a system that was capable of meeting the need. That is why, in the time that I've been Deputy Secretary, um, I've been really focused on helping to support okay, states. But I, I'm sorry, I just got to stop you, because let, let's focus on the question that was asked, okay? Do you accept any responsibility for the unemployment fraud that occurred in California, yes or no? I think that um, an unemployment insurance system that truly delivers in times of crisis should be the goal of everybody. And California's system, like all the systems across the country. Do you accept any responsibility for the unemployment fraud that occurred in California? So let me answer this uh, uh, this way, Congressman, just so we, we are, we are um, uh, we're clear about exactly what, what happened. So over 95% of the fraud that occurred um, in California, but this is consistent with the rest of the country, occurred in a program called Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. I understand all that, and I will stipulate that there were things that were beyond your control. Uh, what I'm asking you is, do you accept any responsibility for the unemployment fraud that occurred in California? So uh, let me just say what the state auditor said, right? The state auditor said that the, the, the reason for the fraud that occurred in that program was two things. One is the completely unprecedented spike in claims, and the second was that the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, in its design, did not have the same safeguards that unemployment insurance has, right? It was designed for a group of individuals who were not eligible okay, for Okay, so you're quoting insurance. the state was, audit report. I happen to have right here, the state audit report. Despite repeated warnings, EDD did not bolster its fraud detection efforts until months into the pandemic. Now, you and your testimony in the Senate you said that uh, as soon as we knew that there was fraud happening, I shut the front door to that fraud. That's what you said, that was your testimony. As soon as we knew that there was fraud happening, I shut the front door to that fraud. You said I made changes to the program that would ensure people wouldn't get in the front door. And yet the very independent audit report that you just cited says exactly the opposite. So how do you reconcile those two things? Thank you, Congressman. I'm not sure, there, there, so there were two reports um, the, what, what you said that, um, what you quoted me as saying, I was talking about one of the things that was built into the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program was automatic backdating, meaning that whenever somebody applied... I, I'm aware that you made changes to automatic backdating, but I'm saying, yeah. is this audit report wrong, that despite repeated warnings, EDD did not bolster its fraud detection efforts under your leadership? Well, so when I said that I shut the front door, it's because we stopped in California the automatic backdating that, um, that meant that somebody who applied I, I understand August, the, the automatic, but I'm not asking about that. Okay. So, so we have another statement here from Cotty Petrie Norris, who is the Democrat who chaired the Assembly Accountability and Administrative Review Committee. She said that this, there were simple and obvious steps that are implemented across the country that you did not implement. And she said that you, in particular, have not done a good job at running the Employment Development Department, and as a result, has wasted billions of dollars and more importantly, caused heartache for millions of Californians. Was Democrat Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris wrong about that? Well, to be clear, Congressman, I did not run the EDD. I was the Labor Secretary in California, but several agencies fell under my purview, and I did take responsibility for our need. There were you know, desperate Californians who were very hard hit by the by, by by closures, by the loss of their jobs, and relied on unemployment insurance. So you do but also take some responsibility for the assistance. fraud. Yes, I do. I, I take and what would you have done differently if you could do it? The did not deliver sure. in ways that we would have hoped that it delivered. But the fraud, as the auditor found, was a result of unprecedented spike in claims and the design of the program. Now, I'm not criticizing. Actually, I do think that any kind of fraud, abuse, none, there's no place in the system for any of that. The fact that that occurred led to you know, steps that we had to take to, to shut down fraud, which also caused delays in eligible individuals getting their claims. It was yeah. a perfect storm. Is there anything storm. that you might have done differently that would have prevented this fraud? Well, that is why in the time that I've been in this role now, I've been very focused on trying to help create a system that is going to and I'm work glad to hear in that. the next crisis. But looking back on what happened in California, $32 billion, huge sum of money that we lost. We're still paying the price for that. Is there anything you would have done differently as secretary to stop that from happening? I mean, again, to the, to, I, mean, I, I do, I, the system needed to work when people needed it, right? And there were 
people who got the benefits that they needed. It helped them stay in their homes. It helped them right, keep food on the table. It helped to support the kind of economic recovery that we've seen now. Ma Madam Chair, I'm, were... I'm out of time here, but I will yield back and just note that uh, we have a, a nominee here who uh, $32 billion was lost. The state auditor found that was because of the performance of her department and still can't tell us one thing she would have done differently. Thank you, Mr. Kiley. Uh, Ms. Stevens, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you've been asked about the huge increase in uh, illegal child labor by migrant children. Uh, here's the New York Times story headline, as migrant children were put to work, U.S. ignored warnings. Subheadline: the White House and federal agencies were repeatedly alerted to signs of children at risk. The warnings were ignored uh, or missed. Now, you've testified that, uh, the, that, that these children are being exploited by unscrupulous employers is the term that you've used. Uh, and you also mentioned that some of this is outside your jurisdiction, which is fair enough. So maybe as a point of common ground, can we agree that we haven't done enough or specifically the Department of Labor needs to do more to crack down on these unscrupulous employers? Do you agree with that? I, I'm certain that the Department of Labor would tell you that they love more resources to go out and do the oversight and enforcement work to make sure kids are not being abused in uh, So as it is, they haven't, had, they haven't done enough. You'd agree with that? I'm sorry? You'd agree they haven't done enough as it is? They've done a, a great deal with the resources they have. I see. There's been a 70 percent increase in illegal child labor. Does that mean there's been, is there 70 percent left staff right now at the Department of Labor? I'm trying to understand why this is a resource question. My suspicion is if you look at their budget to do the oversight and enforcement, it's not grown to meet the needs. I see. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, did forcing two-year-olds to wear masks save lives? I'm, do what now? Did forcing two-year-olds to wear masks save lives? Making sure people wore masks when it was appropriate was essential to make sure that we were able to get out of this pandemic. Sure, but that wasn't my question. Could you answer the question that I asked? Which is? Did forcing two-year-olds to wear masks save and, lives? And who did the forcing? Well, this, your department, or the Head Start, which is under your department, had a mask mandate until late last year for two-year-olds and above, even outdoors. Uh, so can you point to any public health benefit of that policy? Right. We, we never forced anyone to do anything because we don't have the jurisdiction or authority to do that. What we did was provide guidance on what would Mr. be Mr. Secretary, did Head Start have a mask mandate? We, we provide a mask mandate, a requirement for jurisdictions that wish to receive money provide particular services. So Head Start did have a mask mandate for kids, yes? We, we had a mask mandate for uh, jurisdiction, um, excuse me, for agencies that wish to get federal dollars. So that's a yes. So services. can you point to any benefit, not a yes to any public question. health benefit from that policy, whether it was recommended or enforced or forced, of requiring young children to wear masks? Did families benefit from the policy of using all protection, all precautions to avoid? Uh, no, I'm not asking you to COVID? rephrase yes. my question as some abstract question that you'd rather answer. I'm asking that you, as the person who's the Secretary of Health and Human Services, right now, can you point to any evidence that there was a public health benefit to forcing young children to wear masks? Well, the fact that uh, today we are not losing lives the way we lost them when we first got into this pandemic. And you think that's is because we forced two year olds to wear masks? That's your interpretation. What I'm saying to you is that using good policies that give us the precautions to keep uh, our families from contracting COVID are helping save lives. I want to lives. quote you from an article from NPR in January of 2022. It says, the United States is an outlier in recommending masks from the age of two years old. The World Health Organization does not recommend masks for children under age five, while the European equivalent of the CDC doesn't recommend them for children under age 12. In retrospect, was it a mistake for the United States to defy the international norm on child masking? The U.S. has been working closely with our international partners, and we have done more than any other country to try to help But that's not what our, I asked you. I country, asked you, was it a mistake countries? to defy the international norm on the issue of child masking? We continue to use all the best practices when it comes to making sure people take the precautions. Is there a reason you're not answering my question, Mr. Secretary? I'm, I'm answering the question the best, the best I can because you keep phrasing questions that are already geared to get a particular answer. Mr. Secretary, a few weeks ago, we had uh, the testimony from your counterpart, the Secretary of Education, who gave false testimony uh, to this committee. He claimed that he did not encourage states to adopt uh, student vaccine mandates. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, your own uh, recollection of your own advocacy. Did you encourage or support the adoption of student vaccine mandates uh, by states or school districts? We have encouraged states to use all the precautions necessary to protect their populations, including students. Did you, including student vaccine mandates? 
you, you all the precautions to help states protect their population. Right, but specifically, students. did you support student vaccine mandates? We have supported all the policies that show that they help save lives. Did you support student vaccine mandates, yes or no? We have supported all policies that help states make sure people's lives are saved. Mr. Secretary, uh, Madam Chair, I think we had uh, an opening from you asking for the, uh, the witness to give Frank and honest answers, and we're just not getting that today, I'm afraid, and uh, that's very unfortunate. Congress, I yield if you back. pose questions in a way that I could respond to them, I would. Thank you, Mr. Kiley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for organizing uh, this hearing. Uh, we need to make crime illegal again, and uh, I'm uh, encouraged by the comments of the ranking member, which uh, made reference to these flash mobs and the smash and grabs, uh, which shows there's a bipartisan uh, interest in doing just that. I'm from California, uh, the state where this decriminalization agenda is perhaps in its most advanced stage. And to see uh, the perils of it, uh, you need look no further than what's going on in San Francisco as we speak. Uh, just yesterday, Mr. Chair, uh, Westfield Mall, the famous Westfield Mall in downtown San Francisco announced it's surrendering uh, the property to its lender, citing the difficult operating conditions downtown. Almost every day we're learning of new businesses that are closing uh, in San Francisco. In just the last few weeks, that includes T-Mobile, Old Navy, Nordstrom, Whole Foods, Anthropology. Uh, and many more. Um, it, the population is dramatically declining uh, in the city as well. In fact, it's declining faster than any major U.S. Uh, city in United States history, uh, faster even than Detroit when it went bankrupt. If you walk around uh, parts of uh, San Francisco, the conditions are truly horrifying. It's utter lawlessness. Uh, the subway system, um, public transportation is on the verge of collapse because of many reasons, one of which is people simply uh, don't feel safe riding. Uh, and indeed, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, has even said he is sending the National Guard into San Francisco to restore order. Now, that seems to be a stunt because we haven't seen much action yet, but even he recognizes uh, the, uh, the situation and how dire it is. And CNN just did an hour-long special titled, What Happened to San Francisco? And so to answer that question, what happened, I think we can look uh, at a few things. Uh, number one is the laws that have been passed. Number two uh, is the approach to law enforcement. And number three uh, is the role of prosecutors. Uh, on the first count, when it comes uh, to the laws, uh, the chair mentioned Prop 47. Uh, which uh, is one of many uh, laws that have been passed in California that have in very uh, ill-calculated ways uh, lowered criminal penalties. This initiative passed uh, in 2014, and yes, it was approved by California voters, uh, but they were misled as to what they were voting for. This initiative was titled by its supporters the, quote, Safe Neighborhood and Schools Act. And it lowered the threshold uh, for a felony to below to over $950. Uh, and so you see uh, people who just uh, again and again and again go and steal below that threshold, and there's no consequence, and the retailers uh, don't even report uh, what's happening. And now, as the chair mentioned, there's even legislation to stop uh, you know the stores from trying to stop this uh, from happening. And uh, to the point that one of the witnesses, uh, Mr. Uh, Milser, made, uh, which is that these policies are not truly progressive. Uh, in any meaningful sense of the word. One of the other things that Prop 47 did is that it took away penalties uh, for drug possession, which basically eviscerated the drug court system in California uh, because prosecutors no longer had leverage to encourage offenders to go into drug treatment. And so that's the prefer perverse irony, uh, is that laws like Prop 47 have both eroded public safety and compromised the capacity of our criminal justice system to rehabilitate offenders. Uh, there have been many other laws along these lines, Prop 57 passed. That used another trick, which is to classify uh, offenses as nonviolent, even though they're often quite violent. Uh, and then they tell that people that's what they're voting for when uh, obviously it's something much different. You've had this governor and his predecessor have released tens of thousands uh, of people early uh, under the banner of executive authority. You had what was known as realignment, where prison populations were shifted into county jails, which aren't built uh, to deal with those sorts of offenders. Uh, and uh, the list goes on and 
and on and on. And then at the same time, you had jurisdictions like San Francisco uh, that chose to defund police departments. Now, a lot of that has been reversed now because they realize what a disaster it was, but the damage has been done in a lot of ways, and you still have uh, police departments throughout California that are having a very, very difficult time with recruitment uh, and continue to be understaffed because of this anti-law enforcement message that came from some of our state's leading pro uh, politicians. And then finally, you had in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles, these so-called, I'll adopt that terminology, progressive prosecutors, the really political prosecutors who came in with an agenda and refused to even enforce the laws that were there. But here's the big takeaway uh, from all of this, which is that this uh, you know, uh, decriminalization agenda is massively unpopular in California. Uh, the district attorney of San Francisco was overwhelmingly recalled from office. By the way, the Trump-Pence ticket got 12% in San Francisco. This isn't some uh, conservative bastion. You've had dozens of city councils have issued uh, votes of no confidence against George Gascon in Los Angeles. And California voters overwhelmingly say crime is a major problem, and at this point they favor repealing Prop 47 by two to one. So I thank the chair for this uh, opportunity uh, to issue this warning to other jurisdictions not to follow the California example and to marshal whatever federal support we can to make up for the reckless policies of our state's politicians. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, the chair recognizes the, again the ranking member from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for her five minutes of questions. Member uh, Madler and three representatives from California, uh, Mr. Schiff, Mr. S Mr. Swalwell, and Mr. Liu, uh, have attacked you. Mr. Ranking Member Nadler called your report a political exercise with eth ethical ambiguity. Uh, Mr. Liu uh, called you a partisan hack. However, it seems that the, they're taking issue not so much with the conclusions of your report as those of Mr. Mueller's report, uh, which concluded uh, that the investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. That conclusion directly contradicted statements made on the record by those representatives. For example, Mr. Schiff in 2017-2018 made statements such as, the Russians offered help, the campaign accepted help, the Russians gave help, and the president made full use of that help, and that is pretty damning. He also said, there's clear evidence on the issue of collusion. He said, I think there's plenty of evidence of conclusion, collusion or conspiracy in plain sight. Mr. Durham, the gentleman yield? are those statements supported by the conclusions of the Mueller report? The yield? No. Mr. Uh, Durham, is, are those statements supported by the Mueller report? I don't believe so. Mr. Nadler stated, it's clear that the campaign concluded and there's a lot of evidence of that. The question is, was the president involved? Mr. Nadler also said there was obviously a lot of collusion. Uh, Mr. Durham, were those statements supported by the Mueller report? I don't believe they are supported by the Mueller report. Mr. Liu stated uh, in a press release in March of 2017, the bombshell revelation that U.S. officials have information that suggests Trump associates may have colluded, colluded with the Russians means we must pause the entire Trump agenda. We may have an illegitimate president of the United States currently occupying the White House. Uh, Mr. Durham, did the Mueller report establish that we had an illegitimate president occupying the White House? Not to my knowledge. Mr. Swalla stated in 2018, in our investigation, we saw strong evidence of collusion. Did the Mueller report support that there was strong evidence of collusion? Not to my knowledge. Even here today, we had uh, Mr. Schiff uh, raise questions about your public statement uh, during the investigation, saying this somehow violated a DOJ uh, policy. However, Mr. Mueller himself made a public statement uh, in January of 2019. This is an article from CNN headline, Mueller's office disputes BuzzFeed report that Trump directed Michael Cohen to lie to Congress. So whatever policy there might exist in the DOJ with respect to public statements by special counsels, it would seem that you and Mr. Mueller would be on equal footing with respect to it. Is that correct? It would seem so. Mr. Nadler, Ranking Member Nadler also suggested that we're only here today because of the recent indictments of President Trump. However, you received your assignment as special counsel in 2019. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, 2020, the special counsel is in uh, 2020. In 2020. And was that before or after the events alleged in the recent indictments by the, pres by the president? That was before. And is it customary for a special counsel to come testify in Congress upon the issuance of the report? This is my first experience of this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I know that uh, Director Mueller had had occasion to testify before Congress, so I, I guess this is not unique. So it's pretty likely you would have been here whether or not the president had been recently indicted. Yes. Contrary to Ranking Member Nadler's statement. 
I want to quote from you uh, a part of your report where you say, uh, there are reasons why in examining politically charged and high profile issues, the office must exercise and has exercised special care. One of those statements you said is that even when prosecutors believe that they can obtain a conviction, there are some instances in which it may not be advisable to expend government time and resources on a criminal prosecution, particularly where it could create the appearance, even if unfounded, that the government is seeking to criminalize the behavior of political opponents or punish the activities of a specific political party or campaign. Uh, could you just expound on that a little bit, this idea that there are prudential considerations that may counsel against prosecution, even if there has been some technical violation of a statute? Sure. The um, standard principles of federal prosecution include, kind of as a bedrock, that um, you ought not to bring a prosecution unless you believe in good faith that there's sufficient evidence to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, and the jury will convict, um, and that the conviction, a conviction, can be sustained on appeal. There may be those instances in which you're pretty well convinced that a crime was committed and can identify the person who committed it, but you can't in good faith say uh, a jury is likely to convict in this case. We believe that uh, a jury will convict and that we can uh, sustain it on appeal. Those are the principles that we try to apply here, that we followed here. The same principles I've followed for 40 years as a federal prosecutor. But what are you referring to when you, uh, when you say that there uh, might be additional considerations involving the perception that you're criminalizing the behavior of political opponents? Yeah, I mean, th these, are, these are difficult things. For example, uh, taking in this case, uh, I think all the members of the committee have had access to whether they took advantage or not, I don't know, but uh, we filed a, a classified appendix here, right? So there are some prosecutions where it may very well be that it looks like, and you think you can prove the cr crime beyond a reasonable doubt, but because of the classified nature of much of your evidence, it's never going to see the light of day. So that might pre uh, preclude a prosecution. Um, you know, things, things of that sort uh, that come up that uh, are part of the prudential judgment that a prosecutor has to make um, in these matters. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The committee will take a short break, short recess. Uh, if we can come. Good morning, Director Ray. I'd like to take you back to 2021. Uh, in many parts of the country, schools remained closed month after month for no good reason. Uh, once schools did nominally open, many instituted draconian testing and quarantine regimes, uh, such as one student is possibly exposed to COVID, everyone goes home for the week. Children as young as toddlers were subjected to harmful mask mandates that defied international norms. The way some students were treated truly shocks the conscience. Just consider a few examples from my own state of California. A school district in Davis sent an email to parents announcing that their children will be required to eat outside in the rain to reduce exposure to COVID. A school in Sonoma County made young children chew with their masks on, explaining this was to minimize the time spent unmasked. Some schools in Los Angeles limited students to one bathroom break per day and barred them from drinking water outside of the lunch period. A school in the San Ramon Valley made students eat lunch on the ground. In October of that year, the American Academy of Pediatrics would declare a national state of emergency in children's mental health, citing dramatic increases in emergency department visits for all mental health emergencies, included, including suspected suicide attempts. In the face of this, Director, the Biden administration decided to take action. It mobilized the sweeping powers of federal law enforcement. But it wasn't to spare kids from such cruelty, rather it was to target the parents who were speaking out against it. The administration coordinated with the National School Board Association on a letter that began with the alarming claim, America's public schools and its education leaders are under an immediate threat. The letter cited a handful of news stories, almost all of which involved purely expressive activity by parents at school board meetings, and called such activity a form of domestic terrorism. The letter called for the full counterterrorism and law enforcement powers of the federal government, including authority granted under the Patriot Act, to be mobilized to investigate, intercept, and prevent such activity. The Biden administration was ready to take this letter and run with it the moment it was received. After all, administration officials had participated in its drafting. Within five days of receiving it, Attorney General Merrick Garland fired off his infamous memo directing federal action in response to a, quote, disturbing spike in harassment, in intimidation, and threats of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, and staff. 
In response, the FBI opened 25 assessments against parents and even created a new threat tag. Director Ray, did uh, Attorney General Garland consult with you or the FBI before issuing that memorandum? Uh, I, I can't get into discussions that did or maybe more importantly did not happen between the FBI and the department in advance of the... Why do you say more importantly did not? Well, because I will say to you the same thing that I said to all 56 of our field offices as soon as I read the memo, which is that the FBI is not in the business of investigating or policing speech at school board meetings or anywhere else for that matter, and we're not going to start now. Uh, now, violence, threats of violence, that's a different matter. We're going to work with our Correct. state Correct. So that's what the memo was predicated on, and what I'm asking you, was there any evidence that you provided to Attorney General Garland that supported that predicate, that premise that there was an increase in harassment and threats of violence? I, I'm not aware of any such evidence, but I know that we've had a number of, uh, of our folks who have been up here for transcribed interviews. Mm -hmm. um, so unless some of them shared it, I'm not aware of any of that. Well, actually, what they've shared with us points to just the, the opposite. Uh, you had, uh, for example, uh, a letter from uh, Christopher uh, Dunham, acting assistant director in March of this year, where the FBI acknowledged that it has not observed an uptick of threats directed at school officials <coughs> since it began tracking, tracking the data. Does that sound accurate to you? Yes, sir. And is it also true that according to the FBI itself, none of the school board related investigations have resulted in federal arrests or charges? I think that's correct. I think uh, of the 25, uh, and for context, you know, that's 25 um, tips. I'm sorry, I've limited targets. time, so yeah. if that's but, correct, I'd like to move on. This committee's investigation concluded that the Justice Department's own documents demonstrate that there was no compelling nationwide law enforcement justification for the Attorney General's directive. Do you have any reason to dispute that conclusion? Uh, no. So we had an investigation of parents. We had a sweeping mobilization of federal power against the most protected core First Amendment activity, the right of citizens to speak and petition their government on the most important of issues, the education of their children. And you are telling me that the entire basis for that, there was no evidence to support it. Well, I, I want to be clear. We, the FBI, as I said, were not and did not investigate people for exercising. Should Attorney General Garland rights. rescind the memo? I'm sorry? Should Attorney General Garland rescind that memo? Oh, that's a question for the Attorney General. Do you believe he should? Again, I'm, that's a question for the Attorney General. Do you, would you, do you believe that the Attorney General should apologize to parents who are the subject of that memo? I'm not going to speak to that. Will you apologize for the FBI's own role? I think the FBI conducted itself uh, the way it should here, which is that we've considered to continued to follow our longstanding rules and have not changed anything in response to that memo. Time the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman. Kylie. Mr. Secretary, last year you testified before this committee that this administration's policies uh, were not responsible for the surge of illegal border crossings. Uh, and today, you've testified that this administration's policies are responsible uh, for what you claim uh, is a decline in illegal border crossings. Uh, so why is it that you deserve credit when numbers go down, but not blame when numbers go up? Congressman, uh, two points. One, uh, the approach that we are taking, expanding lawful pathways and delivering consequences for those who do not use them, um, is working but I want to communicate that the challenge remains. The challenge is a persistent one on our southern border. It has been for decades, and what we need okay. is Mr. Secretary, you're speaking in general fixing. terms, and I think this is why uh, many of us on the committee are frustrated with the lack of accountability, is that you have shattered all records in terms of illegal border crossings. You say that has nothing to do uh, with the dramatic change in policies you had, and then there's a brief decline, and you cite that as evidence that you're doing a good job. And I think that's why so many Americans have lost faith in this administration's ability to secure the border. But I wanna actually um, reference uh, some remarks you made that I found uh, somewhat encouraging. This was on the topic of detainers. You made these remarks early in your tenure, your April of 2021, at a UCLA uh, discussion for, uh, with the Immigration Law uh, and Policy Center. Um, you said this, you said, uh, you referred to uh, an example of someone who crossed the border illegally and went on to commit sex offenses. And you said, I do not believe that individual should be released into the community. You said, I think the state, the state facility, should turn that individual over to ICE directly. And you added, I think that is a public safety need. 
You went on to say that after such a person had served their sentence, if they were a citizen, they might, there might be no way uh, to keep them out of the community. But you said, I have a tool at my disposal with respect to an individual who unlawfully entered the country. You said, I feel strongly about this. Is it a tool that I have at my disposal? It is a tool I feel obligated to employ. I am going to protect the public, you said. It's a very strong statement in favor of detainers. And yet, over the last uh, couple years, we have seen the actual use of detainers uh, decline dramatically. Fiscal year 2021, there were 65,000. Fiscal year 2022, 78,000. That's about half the average during the Trump administration, about one-third the average during the Obama administration. So if detainers are such a powerful tool, why have you used them so sparingly? Uh, Congressman, uh, let, me, let me communicate a very important point, that individuals who pose a threat to public safety or national security are detained. That is the immigration policy of the Department of Homeland Security under my leadership. But why are you detaining Indivi much less than your predecessor? Ms. Individuals, indivi well, one is our detention capacity is limited, which is why we prioritize public safety and national security threats, number one. And number two, uh, detainers are sometimes not honored by particular jurisdictions. I want to move on to that in a second, but just briefly, uh, has the White House directed you to limit the use of detainers? Congressman. Um, uh, That's a we, yes or no question. Has the White House? Uh, Congressman, no they, no, they have not. Okay, thank you. So on this topic of uh, jurisdictions not honoring detainers, you have been critical of these so-called sanctuary uh, jurisdictions. In a uh, 2022 speech to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, you said some of your cities have declined to cooperate with immigration authorities in the removal, the apprehension, and removal of individuals, even if those individuals pose a public safety threat. You said, I will be coming to you and asking you to reconsider your position of non-cooperation. The public safety, the public's well-being for which we are all charged is, I think, at issue, you said. So, Mr. Secretary, you agree that sanctuary policies threaten public safety. Congressman, uh, what do you mean by sanctuary policies? Because the definition that you gave right there, where you said the... Uh, declining to cooperate with immigration authorities and the removal, the apprehension or removal, removal of individuals even if those individuals pose a public safety threat. Is that, are those sanctuary policies as you define them a threat to public safety? So sanctuary policies are defined differently by different communities. But to your definition. If I, if I may. Is it a threat to public safety? I do not consider it in the service of public safety to release an individual into the community when that individual can be released to Immigration and Customs Enforcement for prompt removal. Thank you. Do you oppose state policies that forbid local authorities from cooperation, cooperating with ICE? Um, I am aware of some that I do oppose. So you oppose California's sanctuary state law? I am not familiar with the particulars of that law. Have you encountered California's restrictions on uh, cooperation with, local, with uh, federal immigration authorities? Congressman, I believe it is imperative that we cooperate with one another. Jurisdictions cooperate with us when it serves the public safety need. Thank you. I'm out of time, but I would like to restate for the record that you, the policies you said uh, that you oppose, overriding the ability of local jurisdictions to cooperate, that's exactly what California's sanctuary state law does. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, the gentleman from uh, uh, California, Mr. Kiley, is recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Ms. Khan. Uh, a few days ago, you lost another case. Uh, this was your challenge to the Activision acquisition. The Northern District of California, in an opinion by a Biden appointee, denied your request for a preliminary injunction. After what the court called a voluminous pre- and post-hearing written submissions, the court found you were not likely to succeed on the merits. You seem to be losing quite a bit, and I, I don't say that to be disrespectful, but these are, after all, taxpayer funds. You're now 0 for 4 in merger trials. The average win rate for the FTC in the modern antitrust era is around 75%. So I have to ask, why are you losing so much? Thanks for the question, Congressman. Uh, I should note, first of all, that the FTC 
has some of the best litigators around. And in the very trial that you mentioned, it was just phenomenal to see, and the judge herself personally commented on how the fact that the FTC, despite being totally out-resourced by some of these companies, was really able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in terms of legal talent and skill. Uh, and I'm enormously proud of our litigation. Well, I'm not sure the taxpayers are going to take much, uh, you know, delight in the legal talent and skill uh, of enforcement actions that cost great taxpayer dollars and end in defeat. So the question is, why is your track record so poor when it comes to actually winning cases? Uh, Congressman, we've had significant success in the courts. Uh, there are a whole set of matters, including uh, our case uh, against Martin Shkreli, where the court found resoundingly in the FTC's favor, uh, also uh, banned Martin Shkreli for life from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we also had- Okay, so you're, but you're 0 for 4 in, in merger trials. And so when I was trying to figure out What's going on here? I, I found maybe a clue uh, in an article from the New York Times, December 7th, 2022, which reported comments you made at a conference where you said this. You said, if there's a law violation and agencies think that current law might make it difficult to reach, there's a huge benefit to still trying. She added that any courtroom losses would signal to Congress that lawmakers need to update, update antitrust laws to better suit the modern economy. I'm certainly not somebody who thinks that success is marked by a 100% uh, court record. You said. So this raises the question, Chair Khan, are you losing on purpose? Congressman, the key clause in the quote mm -hmm. you mentioned was if there is a law violation. We only bring cases when the facts before us lead us to believe that there is a law violation under the existing laws. Uh, on the merger front, there are a whole set of cases where we've won. Uh, including in instances where the parties abandoned and walked away after Okay, the you're over for foreign murder trials. So what did you mean when you said that any courtroom losses would signal to Congress that lawmakers need to update the antitrust laws? What does, what does that mean? So there is an institutional dialogue, right, between enforcers, between Congress, between the courts. Uh, you know, there's a century worth of antitrust back and forth between the agencies, between Congress. This very committee in the 1950s determined that the agencies were not bringing the types of cases that Congress was worried about in terms of monopoly power. Congress okay, but you're actually bringing the cases, you're losing because you don't have the authority that you want from Congress. So this is how you think you're gonna persuade Congress to give you more authority, is by exceeding the authority that you now have? Congressman, again, we only bring lawsuits where we believe there is a law violation given the facts and the law at hand. Uh, you know, we, we fight hard when we believe that there is a law violation, and unfortunately things don't always go our way, but uh, we, you know, make determinations. But, but about are you bringing cases appeal. that you expect to lose? Could you repeat are that? Are you bringing cases that you expect to lose? Absolutely not. Okay, well, your track record seems to suggest otherwise. Let's look more closely at the Activision decision, though. Uh, the court first noted that in an attempt to lower your burden, you essentially made up case law. You couldn't find anything, uh, actually, that the courts have provided in terms of precedent, so you cited to your own FTC decision uh, as precedent. But irrespective of the legal standard, uh, the court, you probably wouldn't have won under any standard because the court said this, that the FTC has not raised serious questions regarding whether the pro proposed merger is likely to substantially lessen competition, not raised serious questions. The court also rejected your assert not only rejected your assertion of a likely anti-competitive effect, but found just the op opposite, that the record evidence points to more consumer access. So why should Americans have faith in your judgment when this Biden-appointed judge says you are so far off the mark? Congressman, this matter is still pending before the FTC in administrative adjudication, so I'm just going to be limited in what I can say about the merits. Uh, our complaint lays out uh, the staff's view of the, what this merger would result in and why that would be a law violation. Uh, you may but have the judge roundly this. rejected it and said there weren't even serious questions, and now having lost, you're spending even more taxpayer money on an appeal that you're even less likely to win because the appeals court is going to defer to the trial court's findings of fact in this very fact-intensive matter. So why are you spending even more taxpayer resources pursuing this appeal? So I can say, again, this was a you know, staff recommendation. I can say it a general matter. Uh, staff always looks closely at an opinion and looks at whether there are certain errors in law that they believe are worth appealing on. Those are, in general, the types of determinations that go into whether the FTC ends up appealing. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair now recognizes. The Do you believe Christopher Ray is a competent director of the FBI? I think Mr. Ray is a person of the highest integrity, for whom I have great admiration, who has extraordinary experience 
uh, both as Thank a you. career and so you, prosecutor. You certainly don't think he would knowingly give false testimony to this committee, do I you? Sir, I am sure that he would not. Are you aware that uh, Director Ray, a couple months ago in sworn testimony, implicated you in a sweeping abuse of power? I doubt he would characterize whatever, you, uh, whatever he said in that way. Well, he testified about the school board memo that you issued uh, on October 4th of 2021, uh, in which you mobilized federal law enforcement powers against American parents. Now, of course, you didn't put it quite like that. Uh, instead, you found a pretext, which is stated right here in the first line of the memo. In recent months, there has been a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, and staff. What was your basis for making that claim? I will say again, as I've testified numerous times in response to exactly the same question, that I, I, I saw numerous uh, reports in the press of violence and threats. You saw reports in the press, and so you decided to instigate a nationwide law enforcement initiative? If I may be permitted to answer the question. Please. Uh, numerous reports in the media of violence and threats of violence against school personnel of all kinds. We did, you, did you consult we, with the FBI director? We received a letter from the National Association of School Boards reporting. Yes, that letter contained anecdotes. It didn't contain data of an increase. Did you, yes or no, consult with the FBI director before issuing the memo? I don't believe I spoke with the FBI director, no. Why not? Why wouldn't you consult with the FBI director? Because the purpose of the memo as is very clear from the memo, is to ask the FBI to assess the situation, to hold meetings, and to determine whether Mr. this Mr. Attorney was General, you started with a conclusion that there was an increase uh, in threats. Now, if you had bothered to consult with the FBI director, here's what he would have said. This is from his sworn testimony, that he was not aware of any such evidence. So my question to you, sir, sitting here today, is can you substantiate your claim that there was an increase? Of course, there will always be criminal, sporadic criminal activity in all quarters of society, but your claim was there was an increase. Can you substantiate that sitting here today? I can substantiate that by the reports in the press of violence and threats of violence and by the letters sent by representatives of thousands. That's a no. You're giving us anecdotes. I'm asking you if you had data. You also said in your memo uh, that you were committed to using the department's authority and resources to discourage these threats, identify them when they occur, and prosecute them when appropriate. Were there any such prosecutions? The emphasis should be there on when appropriate, and there were no such prosecutions, and that's good news, not bad news. There were no prosecutions, and in fact, Director Ray said there were no arrests, there were no charges. So you have no data to show us that there was any increase. You didn't even bother to consult with the FBI director, and then there were no resulting prosecutions, even though you said that they were coming. So I have to ask you now, in retrospect, was there a compelling law enforcement justification for the memo? I think you're mischaracterizing the memo. The, question, the purpose of the memo was to hold meetings, to open lines of communication with states. So is that a no? Yes or no? Was there a compelling law enforcement justification for that? I believe there was a, ne a reason to ask for those contacts to be made with state and local law enforcement. Well, the FBI director disagrees with you. When well, I that's asked not what the FBI director said. Look at it I'm right sorry. here, uh, Mr. Attorney General. When asked, do you have any reason to dispute the conclusion that there was no nationwide law enforcement justification? He said he didn't. Either he didn't see the reports or he didn't see the national. This is a transcript. School. I've sent you this transcript, Mr. Attorney General. So my question is this: Will you retract the memo? And by that I mean issue a formal document to the effect that it is no longer operative. I will not, because there was absolutely nothing wrong with the memo, as I have testified several times already. Even though you. your own FBI director says there was no justification for it, you will not retract it. The memo is mine. It's my decision whether it's necessary to make assessments like this. And I asked the Bureau to make these assessments and the other- Are you familiar with the concept of a chilling effect? I'm sorry, I didn't- Are you familiar with the concept of a chilling effect? I'm very familiar and that's the very reason- How would you define a chilling effect is, as it relates to First Amendment jurisprudence? That's the very reason why the second sentence of the memo- Please tell me what you do, uh, consider to be the definition of a chilling effect. That memo has no chilling effect. The I didn't ask you your opinion on whether the memo has one. I asked you what is a chilling effect. I'm telling you that the second sentence of that makes clear I've read the full memo. I'm asking you what do you define a chilling effect as? A 
Chilling effect is when um, um, people's uh, exercise of First Amendment rights are chilled by coercive activity by the government, which did not occur here. So here we're dealing Mr. with moms and Mr. dads. Mr. Chairman, you and point, I are point of order officials. with respect to the time. Yeah. Point of order. The, the gentleman's time has expired, but it was a pretty darn important question when the Attorney General of the United States can't define what a chilling effect is, so I thought it would let it go a few seconds. The, uh, uh, the Attorney General did define what a chilling effect is and said it didn't occur here. I don't think he defined it. He just, he just dismissed it. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. I thought it was a very important five minutes. We now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Kiley. What's happening in Chicago is a travesty. And uh, unfortunately, there are some in the world of politics uh, who would prefer not to talk about what's happening in Chicago, who would have us become almost habituated uh, to the horrifying scale uh, of violence and death going on here. And so I think this is a really important hearing that we're having today to send a loud and clear message that what's happening here should never happen in the United States of America. For that matter, what's happening in Manhattan should never happen in the United States of America. What's happening in LA should never happen in the United States. What's happening in San Francisco should never happen in the United States. San Francisco is one of the most beautiful places on earth, and it's now losing people faster than any major city in US history, largely because of the crime situation there. So there is no doubt that we need to restore proper penalties for criminal conduct as well as, by the way, restore evidence-based rehabilitation to help offenders turn their lives around. But what is just as important, I believe, is we as a country need to restore the proper respect and admiration uh, for our men and women in law enforcement. Because if you talk to any uh, police chief or sheriff and any community around the country, they will tell you that they are understaffed, that they are having trouble retaining people, they're having trouble uh, recruiting people. Uh, here in Chicago, for example, since 2019, the Chicago Force has lost 3,300 officers. They've only replaced about half of them. Uh, Lieutenant Garrido, you testified that the force is about 2,000 uh, officers short. Resignations increased by 65% from 2000 to 2021. Uh, one former state prosecutor said that mor morale among law enforcement in Illinois is at an all-time low. But it's not just happening here. A uh, survey from 2023 by the Police Executive Research Forum showed that agencies are losing officers faster than they can hire new ones. And there were nearly 50% more resignations in 2022 than in 2019, such that the total sworn staff has dropped nearly 5% over the last three years. In my state of California, the total patrol officers dropped by over 13% over a little more than a decade. That means it dropped from 195 officers per 100,000 residents to just 169, and this level is now the lowest level uh, since at least 1999, 1991, which of course means when you have fewer officers uh, patrolling the streets that criminals are able to operate uh, with greater uh, impunity. So uh, Lieutenant Garrido, there are obviously uh, a lot of causes uh, of this problem, uh, you know, in particular the t taking tools away uh, from law enforcement officers to do their jobs and the actual defunding uh, of the police. But to what extent is this attributable as well to sort of a hangover of the defund the police movement and the toxic malicious rhetoric that was directed at law enforcement by certain uh, people in public life? Oh, th this is mission accomplished for the defund the police movement. Uh, when I took the exam in 1989 to come on the job, 35,000 people took the test with me. Now they're lucky if they can get 1,500 people to take the test. They're actually, you can walk in the day of and actually take the exam if you just happen to be strolling by and see that there's a, a test being given. It's extremely difficult to recruit right now. Uh, and that's all by and large because of the way that our elected officials, uh, and, and uh, some would say maybe they don't realize it, but I think they do. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're saying. And they're demonizing our officers. And they're making this job not desirable. So nobody wants to come on it. And another significant in impact, uh, my father was a Chicago police officer. My uncle was a Chicago police officer. Uh, at one time, uh, I know Carlos's father was a Chicago police officer. At one time, parents, we, you know, they would, we, they would want their kids to follow in their footsteps. Now there's a huge movement. I don't know that I don't know anybody that would tell their children to come on the job now. Yeah, I and, mean, that, and that's a big portion. I mean, uh, you know, children of police officers is a large yeah. portion of our our force, and they're just not doing it anymore. That's a really important point. 
And so this message that you know our uh, police officers, our men and women in law enforcement, are the guardians of our community. Uh, well, the rest of us run away from danger. They run to danger. Uh, their work is the cornerstone of a civil society, uh, the, protecting the rule of law. And yet you had all of this rhetoric vilifying police officers that sent precisely the opposite message. So in addition to changing our laws, I think we really need to rededicate ourselves as a country uh, to honoring and celebrating uh, those folks who are in law enforcement and to have uh, almost a new uh, national campaign uh, dedicated to, uh, to, to uh, you know, celebrating law enforcement as an honorable calling, a noble calling, in order to inspire a new generation of young people, including those who are uh, sons and daughters of folks who are in law enforcement now. Uh, to want to serve, uh, to see the problems that we're facing in many of our cities and say that uh, in spite of the risks, they want to be part of the solution because uh, it's a function that is so closely tied uh, to the public good. Um, so I think that you know all of us have a role to play in that. Uh, one thing I did is for Police Week, I honored uh, uh, an officer with different de in different departments within my district, as we called the police honor roll, and gave them a congressional recognition uh, on the floor uh, of the House of Representatives. Um, for citizens, just thanking uh, officers when you come across them uh, in daily life, I think can go a long way as well. And sort of in that vein, in closing, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone here today, including our two witnesses of course, uh, for your service to your community and to our country. Thank I you. yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Um, and that's a great point about the, the, the family and the tradition, the legacy that's, that's there and, 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 and how, that's, uh, how that's changing, unfortunately. Uh, we have three more uh, members. We have Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Gates via, uh, via Zoom, and then we'll, we'll finish with the gentlelady from this, this great state, uh, uh, Ms. Miller. So Mr. Fitzgerald is recognized for five minutes. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Kiley. A truly terrible sickness has afflicted colleges and universities in this country, uh, which has reached horrifying levels over the course of the last month. And we have to ask, how is it that in the United States of America in the 21st century have our supposedly most elite institutions been gripped by one of the most ancient retrograde prejudices that the world has ever known? How is it that universities that have systematically suppressed free speech for years, how have they suddenly discovered the First Amendment and invoked free speech as a reason not to condemn terrorism and anti-Semitism? How is it that institutions that have proliferated their diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracies are turning a blind eye now to attacks on Jewish students on their own campuses? How is it that university administrations that have waded into every political issue of the day are now suddenly bound by institutional neutrality when it comes to the murder of children? Perhaps the intolerable irony and hypocrisy of it all is best illustrated by Harvard University, whose leadership remained silent and said nothing for days after October 7th. Meanwhile, 24 student groups filled the vacuum with a statement explaining that Israel itself was solely to blame for the attack. And it was only after enormous criticism from alumni like myself and Representative Elise Stefanik that Harvard President Colleen Gay came out with a very tepid statement, which still refused to condemn the student groups and instead said that Harvard is committed to free expression. The thing is, Harvard is not committed to free expression. There was a recent ranking of how committed 248 universities are to free expression, and Harvard was ranked dead last, number 248, the only institution to receive the abysmal rating. But I actually think that these things are not unrelated. And uh, Mr. Marcus, I think your testimony established that, that uh, the suppression of free speech and the rise of anti-Semitism actually in some ways go hand in hand. Uh, do you believe that the systematic suppression of free speech on college campuses has served to fuel the rise of anti-Semitism by silencing and excluding Jewish students on campus? Uh, yes, sir, Congressman. I think that there is a culture of intolerance in which certain viewpoints and certain identities are privileged and certain other ones are condemned. We no longer have on even our greatest college campuses a sense that we should have a reasoned debate among all or that every group should be treated with the same degree of equality. What we have is a kind of 
orthodoxy, uh, which is taken over uh, from the faculty and also the student body. And this has implications not only for conservatives, but for other groups who are disdained within the institution, including uh, Jewish Americans. I'd like to uh, read a portion of a letter from the Legislative Jewish Caucus uh, in California uh, to show just how dire the situation is at the public universities in my own state. This is a letter addressed to the CSU, California State University, and the leader and the UC leaders. It says, among numerous other examples, we have heard from Jewish students at UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and San Jose State who report being physically attacked for expressing support for Israel. Jewish students at UC San Diego who required a police escort in order to safely leave a student meeting. Obscene anti-Israeli graffiti on a Jewish ritual space at Cal Poly Humboldt. Anti-Israel rallies at USCLA that interrupted classes with hate-filled rhetoric. A social media post by a UC Davis faculty member with knife, axe, and blood emojis calling for violence against Zionists in their homes and in their kids in school. And an increased need for, need for armed security at Jewish student centers on multiple campuses. Shockingly, the letter continues, anti-Israel student groups immediately celebrated the Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th, while the UC Ethnic Studies Faculty Council glorified the largest mass murder, rape, and kidnapping of Jewish civilians since the Holocaust as worthy of support as part of the Palestinian freedom struggle. The letter goes on from these 18 legislators that Jewish students and faculty have shared with us disturbing examples of Jewish students being denied opportunities afforded to other student groups. Examples include administrators providing space on campus to various identity and affinity groups, but not to Jewish student organizations, and at least one Israeli student at UC Berkeley being told she could not participate in a class-related conference because of her nationality. Uh, given your experience at the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Education, do you believe there is more uh, that the department could be doing uh, about this sort of uh, uh, discrimination uh, and activity on campuses? Absolutely. Uh, there is more that the department can be doing, and it can do it tomorrow. Uh, the department has sent out links for Jewish students to file complaints. Uh, it has added language to its complaint forms. That's fine. But there is no reason why the department needs to wait for Jewish students to come to them. The department has the authority to initiate self-directed investigations anytime it opens the newspaper and sees that there is a problem at an institution that receives federal funds. And that's every single day if they're reading the papers. Moreover, Secretary of Education has the authority to commence nationwide compliance reviews in particular areas that are of concern. And again, there's no way that one can pay attention to higher education today and not realize that this is a serious national problem. These are things that can be done quickly, that don't require legislation, they don't require significant infusions of funds, they can be done with the current resources, and that can be done with the authority that the Secretary of Education already has. Thank you, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman recognizes, uh, uh, or the chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Ms. Fry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having this hearing today, actually. Um, freedom of speech for me, but not thee, I think is the central theme for conservatives on college campuses. That's the unfortunate.